Okay, good morning and welcome to today's Education Committee Oversight Hearing on Earning an Associate's Degree in New York City's High Schools. I want to thank my co-chair, Councilmember Barron, for holding today's hearing. Having a college education is more important now than ever. Attending college gives individuals access to more job opportunities and the ability to earn higher wages. College, college graduates are in demand and many industries and careers now consider them mandatory. Yet according to census data from 2013, almost half of New York City's adults reported that they did not have at least an associate's degree. Additionally, data shows that many students enrolling in City University of New York schools endure academic challenges. For example, at CUNY's seven community colleges, only 17% of students graduated within three years. In addition, currently more than 6,000 students enrolled in CUNY each year need remedial courses in basic academic skills such as reading, math, and writing. In an effort to make college more accessible to all students, the Department of Education has partnered with post-secondary institutions like CUNY and Bard College to allow high school students to take up to two years of college credit while in high school and earn their associate's degree at no cost. This allows these students to save both time and money and get a jump start on furthering their education. Through CUNY's Early College Initiative Program, over 7,000 students at 17 DOE schools have the opportunity to earn an associate's degree at a partnering CUNY college. Bard's High School Early College, which has campuses in both Manhattan and Queens, serves approximately 1,213 students. I am particularly interested in hearing more about the recent efforts of Bard to increase the diversity of its early college student population. At today's hearing, the committees look forward to hearing about the current programs offered to students, the efforts made by the DOE to inform prospective students about these programs, and student outcomes after enrolling in and graduating from such programs. The committees are also interested in learning whether the DOE has plans to expand the model in the future. I'd like to remind everyone who wishes to testify today that you must fill out a witness slip, which is located on the desk of the Sergeant at Arms near the front of this room. To allow as many people as possible to testify, testimony will be limited to three minutes per person. And uh, with that, I'd like to announce we've been joined by Councilmember James Vaca, Councilmember Margaret Chin, Councilmember Mark Traeger, Councilmember Alan Maisel, and I will now turn it over to my co-chair, Councilmember Inez Barron. Thank you, Councilmember John. Good morning. My name is Inez Barron, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Higher Education. We're joined, I'm joined by the, we're joined together with the Education Committee, chaired by my colleague, Daniel Drum, who, like me, is a former public school teacher. Mm -hmm. As some of you may know, I was a public school teacher and principal for 36 years before I retired and became involved in the political arena. During that time, my experience as an educator and an administrator left me with deep appreciation for some of the challenges students experience in pursuing their education. In today's global economy, we know that a college education has become even more important. It is, in fact, projected that New York City will gain 284,000 jobs that will require a bachelor's degree or more, while an additional 201,000 jobs will require an associate's degree or some college and 72,000 jobs will require a high school diploma. Before the end of this decade, employer demand for employees with an associate's degree will increase by 21%. As a result, students who do not graduate from high school or college will be forced to accept the grim reality of living life on an economic margin, in the economic margins that mean they will find it extremely difficult to achieve economic self-sufficiency contribute to the economy, or more importantly, support themselves and their family. Yet, the current state of our education system indicates a lack of work, a, a lot of work remains to be done. Too many students are graduating from high school unprepared for college. We know this because a recent study indicated that over 6,000 students who enter CUNY have remedial needs in one of the basic academic skill areas, math, reading, and writing. As you all know, remediation often means that students will have to spend more time and resources to graduate. For many low-income students, this can present an additional buffer and hurdle to graduating on time because many have to work to take care of their families. 
While I applaud CUNY for its innovative programs such as CUNY START and the Accelerated Study and Associate Programs, ASAP, which are designed to increase retention and graduation rates, there's a need to better understand why so many of our high school graduates are not prepared for the rigors of college. One program designed to do just that is CUNY's Early College Initiative, which was designed to improve high school graduation rates as well as prepare students for the rigors of college. ECI offers students the opportunity to earn an associate's degree while in high school at no additional cost. The program model is based on the belief that by engaging students early in the college experience through challenging coursework, students will not only be motivated to do well, but their experience in the program will encourage them to earn college credit, which will increase their chances for college success and completion. The program tar targets students who have historically been underrepresented in higher education. This includes low-income students, students who are the first in their family to go to college, and English la language learners. A recent study by CUNY of its ECI program revealed four significant findings. One, ECI students graduated on time at modestly higher rates than students not in the ECI program. Two, ECI students were more likely to be considered college ready. Three, by earning more college credits while in high school, ECI students were better prepared for college degree completion. And four, ECI students had better college retention rates than students in non-ECI schools. The study also found that black and low-performing students perform much better than students in non-ECI st schools. These findings are promising and indicate the program is having a positive impact on targeted students. However, it remains unclear why so many students graduate, how so many students graduate with an associate's degree. We don't know the number. Additionally, I'm concerned about how many ECI students actually graduate from college. The study indicated that only 4% of ECI students graduated from college. That number is quite low, and one would expect a higher graduation rate if 86% of ECI college students graduated from high school on time with an average of 16 credits. The study further found that by the end of the second year in college, ECI students had an average of 31 credits, which placed them a semester ahead of students with non-ECI schools who had only accumulated 13 credits. That data suggests that more students should be graduating given the number of credits they have accumulated in college. I'm looking forward to hearing more on this issue from CUNY. Another early college high school is Bard College's Bard High School Early College, which offers high school students the opportunity to earn an associate's degree while earning their high school diploma in four years. With 93% of the 2016 class graduating, with 93% of the 2016 class graduating, 93% graduating with an associate's degree conferred by Bard College, it is clear that students are doing well in Bard's early college program. However, I was disappointed to learn that only 28% of the 2015-16 student population on its Queen campus and only 32% of its student population on its Manhattan campus was comprised of Hispanic and black students. Even more alarming was that special needs students accounted for only 2% of the total population, and no English language learners were enrolled. That's a poor reflection of the city's diverse population. During today's hearing, I'm interested in learning more about the student curriculum at ECI schools, as well as the type of support students are offered to enable their success as they pursue their high school diploma and accumulate college credits. As I indicated earlier, I would like to know how many students graduated with an associate's degree and ECI student outcomes in college. If ECI stated, if ECI's stated goal is to increase high school graduation rates and prepare them for college, I want to know why more students are not graduating from college. I would also like to hear whether Bard's High School has any plans to increase student diversity, and if so, how it plans to do so. Uh, I would like to thank my Chief of Staff, Joy Simmons, um, my CUNY liaison, Omawali Clay, uh, 
Ms. M. Indigo Washington, my Director of Legislation, Kairu Gichuru, my Legislative, uh, my Committee Counsel, Chloe Riviere, the Committee's Policy Analyst, and Jessica Ask Ackerman, Senior Finance Analyst to the Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Barron. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank my staff, Sebastian McGuire, my counsel, Smita Deshmukh, my senior legislative counsel, Jan Atwell, senior policy analyst, Joan Pavolny, senior policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, who for the first time has been really working very hard on a hearing. Uh, thank you, Kalima, policy analyst, Elizabeth Hoffman, the principal finance analyst, and Caitlin O'Hagan, uh, the finance analyst for the education committee as well. Um, so I want to also announce that we've been joined by council member Helen Rosenthal and by council member Edonis, uh, excuse me, Fernando Cabrera. <laughs> okay. Oh, and Edonis is here. Okay. I thought I saw Edonis coming in. Okay. So, um, with that, I'm going to uh, introduce our first panel, which is the Deputy Chancellor for the New York City Department of Education, Phil Weinberg, and Reina Utsonomiya from the New York City Office of Post-Secondary Education. I apologize if I messed up your last name. Uh, and with that, I'd also like to ask you to raise your right hand so I can swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Okay, thank you. Deputy Chancellor, would you like to start? Sure. Good morning, Chairs Drum and Barron and members of the New York City uh, Council Committees on Education and Higher Education here today. My name is Phil Weinberg, the New York City Department of Education's Deputy Chancellor for Teaching and Learning. I am joined by Reina Utsunomiya. Senior Director of Grades 9 through 14 Early College and Career Schools. We are pleased to be here today to discuss our commitment to college and career pathways, particularly the progress we have made in our early college programs. Through our Equity and Excellence for All agenda, the City is working to ensure that by 2026, 80% of students graduate high school on time and two-thirds two of our graduates are college ready. We want our students to graduate with the option to pursue and succeed in the college or career of their choice. As we work to reach these goals, early exposure to college and work experiences can be a game changer for many of our students, particularly students from low-income families, first-generation college students, students of color, and students who have struggled academically. We are making these investments across the city through our AP for All and College Access for All initiatives. In just the past two weeks, we've been proud to announce a record number of students taking and passing rigorous AP exams and a record number of schools supporting their students on the path to college during College Application Week. As part of our broader efforts, DOE offers an array of programs for students to take college classes while they are still in high school. These range from individual courses such as CUNY College Now and dual credit courses to whole school, early college, high school model where students take high school and college courses concurrently. Early college high schools are unique in that they are designed for students to earn up to 60 college credits or the equivalent of two years worth of college towards an associate's degree while they, while they are in high school. Students in these schools may begin taking college classes as early as in the 10th grade. Each school partners with a dedicated college partner to offer courses to its students. There are three key characteristics for all of our early college schools that make them invaluable for students. First, our students take the college courses tuition free because the costs are covered by the DOE and the higher education institution. Second, students who successfully pass their college courses in high school can transfer or apply these college credits toward a four-year Bachelor of Arts or Science degree. In some cases, students are saving up to two years worth of college tuition by completing these courses while they are in high school. And third, these schools have specifically designed their curriculum for students to take high school and college classes concurrently. We currently have 19 early college high schools located in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens, serving over 8,000 high school students citywide. CUNY oversees 10 early college high schools that partner with dedicated CUNY community and senior colleges. 
each of these CUNY early college high schools offer college courses towards an associate's degree in liberal arts from their partner college. The first two of these CUNY early college schools were opened in the 1990s, with, additional, with the additional eight launched between 2000 and 2008. CUNY and the DOE share the cost of these schools' college tuition. Bard College operates two early college schools. The first opened in Manhattan on the Lower East Side in 2001, and the second opened in Queens in Long Island City in 2008. Students attending these schools may earn college credits toward an associate's degree awarded by Bard, by Bard College. The DOE and CUNY also collaborate on seven early college and career high schools which are designed as six-year schools or grades nine through 14. Each of these schools partner with a CUNY community college and focus on a STEM-focused associate's degree and also incorporate significant career and technical education component working with their dedicated industry partner. The first grades nine through 14 school opened in 2011 followed by two more in 2013 and three additional in 2014. One of the CUNY early college schools that opened in 2009 is now transitioning into a grades nine through 14 school. I want to share a little more information with you today about these grades nine through 14 schools. We believe this model is one example of our vision for an equity and excellence for all in action. That's because our grades nine through 14 schools represent a targeted effort to bridge high school and college for underrepresented students and break down the barriers that research has shown to be one of the major obstacles of college enrollment and persistence. You may have heard the, of these schools referred to as PTEC, Pathways in Technology Early College High School schools, named after the original PTEC school in Brooklyn, which opened in the fall of 2011. This model was born out of converging interests between the public and private sectors in particular, a collaboration with IBM and CUNY to link high school and college with industry-based skills training for students who are underrepresented in science, technology, engineering, and math fields, and higher education. Our nine through 14 schools do not require students to meet any academic criteria for admission and serve a student population that is approximately 80% black and Latino and 80% of the students are eligible for free and reduced price lunch. They are one option for students to focus on growing academically and pursuing college and career as real options after high school. Every grades nine through 14 school works with a primary industry partner and a college to focus on a specific career pathway. Each school's six-year curriculum is designed in collaboration with these partners so that the academic and career and technical education courses will prepare students to segue into college courses aligned with STEM-related associate's degrees. These seven schools' career and associate's degree pathways represent a wide breadth of STEM fields that include nursing and community health, civil and electromechanical engineering, IT, Multimedia arts and technology, digital marketing, construction management, architectural technology, computer information systems, and energy technology. All of these degrees and career pathways have been selected with input from our school's industry partners, which include Con Edison, National Grid, New York Presbyterian Hospital, Montefiore Medical Center, IBM, SAP, New York City Transit, CH2M and the American Association for Advertising Agencies. All of these industry partners represent high growth job sectors in need of a diverse and skilled workforce right here in New York City. Because these students' college and career, these college courses geared toward more science and math than other early college schools, each school work, works closely with its CUNY community college partner to coordinate the sequence of high school and progressively challenging college courses. Students in grades nine through 14 schools must demonstrate readiness to take college courses by meeting CUNY proficiency levels, and that is a primary focus of each of these schools. The school also aligns supports for students in the college classes, including advisory and seminars, as well as direct tutoring to support them while they're managing their college course load. The industry partners also play critical roles in supporting the student's career exploration. 
As part of each school's CTE program, students are involved in various career awareness and training activities with industry partners throughout their six-year experience. These include group mentoring, job site visits, and mock interviews to more hands-on learning such as jobs shadowing and internships. These opportunities offer students valuable social capital for their interacting with industry professionals as well as practicing their own networking and professional skills. Our school's industry partners in turn see how they have direct impact on students' perceptions about the working world and the value of helping to develop their future workforce. Partners have shown their commitment in a variety of ways, such as hiring over 50 students for summer internships or funding a new engineering lab at a school. Grades 9 through 14 schools are still in their early stages of development. PTEC's founding cohort students from its 2011 opening class just graduated this past June, and two more schools just had their first cohort of students complete four years. We look forward to sharing the outcomes of this work as these schools build a track record. As these schools continue to grow, we also know there is continuing demand for grades 9 through 14 schools and programs to reach more students. We are looking to expand the grades 9 through 14 model to three more sites with the aim to reach geographic areas that are still underserved. Thank you again for this opportunity to discuss our equity and excellence for all investments in college access and readiness, specifically our grades 9 through 14 early college and career schools. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chancellor Weinberg, for that uh, testimony. Uh, let me start off just by asking you a little bit about how uh, ECI was created. What was the idea behind it, and uh, why did the DOE um, invest in um, a program such as ECI? Well, the, the first early college started in the 90s, and I'm not um, prepared to speak about that, but I think the ongoing work throughout the 2000s has been about the belief that both institutions have that making a smooth handoff of uh, students from the DOE to CUNY is important and that the closer, the more closely that we work together, uh, the more proactive and intentional we can be about making sure our students know well what it takes to be successful in their post-secondary degrees and in their careers um, after that. Is there any relationship between uh, the students who stay in college, um, or the students who are in these programs are more likely to stay in college and to go on to uh, finish their four-year degrees? I'll ask my colleague Raina to respond. Um, and I, good morning, uh, my name is Raina Utsunomiya. Um, we definitely have seen a trajectory for the students, especially for those who have accumulated at least 30 credits that allow them to then transfer on into the senior colleges in, in the CUNY system. So we know that this is definitely an opportunity for the students not only to learn about um, what it takes to persist in college, but also to have that leg up to really be able to then advance in their education at the higher education level. How are students admitted into the program? Um, well, for the 9 to 14 specifically, these students are um, basically, they do not require any academic screening. So for these students, they basically have to attend an information session or an open house to learn about the programs, and that's basically it. Um, our schools are very active in participating in citywide and the borough high school fairs, and they also host several open house events so that they can get the information out about these schools, and also working with their local middle schools so that they can develop some relationships there as well. Can you describe for me the, um, the faculty and staff uh, that are involved in these programs? Are they uh, DOE uh, licensed teachers or, and uh, college professors or a combination of the above? How Absolutely. does that work? Sure. So at the high school, they are all uh, state and DOE certified instructors. Um, because these schools are a combination of um, academic and CTE, um, we have both the core subject area teachers as well as career and technical education teachers. Um, the college courses are taught by the faculty from the community colleges, so those are definitely 
um, you know, professors from the participating colleges. In some rare cases, we may also have opportunities where the staff at the high school may have adjunct status so that they are also able to support the students both in, in teaching both the high school and college course. So can you give us some examples of what the high school subjects, are, that a high school teacher would be teaching and the, the subjects that a college professor might be teaching? Sure. Um, so the core subject area, the students are still required to meet all their high school requirements. So they would still be taking all their English language arts, math, science, um, social studies, physical education. Um, all those core subjects are taught by the high school staff along with any career and technical education subjects, which can really be something from as basic as introduction to IT or whatever to um, progressively more advanced um, coursework within their technical subject areas. Um, the courses that are taught with by the college are actually um, uh, the school would work with the college to design what would be the appropriate sequence of courses for the students to take. Um, it wouldn't be fair for the students to all of a sudden be thrown into an English composition class. So generally there's a, a gradual, um, uh, there's an opportunity for the students to begin taking um, an entry level college course, which might be um, you know, communications, public speaking, critical thinking. Um, and then as students are um, meeting CUNY proficiency levels, they would be taking many of the general education or CUNY pathway courses that would be required of any college student. So can you describe for me the difference between a 9 to 12 and a 9 to 14 school? Um, I was a little bit confused by that. So are the students who are in the 9 to 14 program, for example, are they physically in a DOE site when it's the extra two years there? I think the main difference is for us thinking about who the students are coming in. Um, for the majority of the 9 to 14 schools, the students' proficiency levels are really um, a wide range. They, we have high, highly, academic, uh, highly achieving students and then the majority of the students being um, you know, struggling academically or who have come in behind grade level. So, um, working with them over the course of their high school experience to make sure that they are not only catching up, but also being able to then be ready to take the college courses is a huge leap that we are pushing for within the 9 to 14. The additional two years of high school is actually designed so that they have that extra time to finish their college coursework, although the college portion does begin while they are still, you know, perhaps even 10th grade, but um, in 11th and 12th grade, um, we see that that additional time provides the students to really learn what it takes to persist at the college level, but also receive a lot of the supports that they may otherwise not um, be able to find on their own. Um, as Council Member Barron had mentioned, um, a lot of life challenges that they face so that um, it might prevent them from continuing in their education. So. Um, the additional two years that we're able to provide under this model really make sure that the high school provides them the space to at least receive the support from, um, adult, from teachers and adults that they know very well, and, um, but still be able to continue on and persist at the college level. So how many um, 9 to 12 programs are there and how many 9 to 14 programs are there? Working with CUNY, there are 10 of, well, 10 grades 6, 12, and 9 to 12 schools. Um, some of them are secondary schools. And then there are seven of the 9 to 14 schools. Uh, just to go back to what you were saying before, is P-TECH a 9 to 14 program? Yes, it is. It is also, okay. Um, I think that you have an ECI school in every borough except for Staten Island, if I'm not That's mistaken. Correct. That's correct. Are there, are there any plans to expand the program? We definitely are looking at um, different locations that are still underserved, Staten Island definitely being one of them. Um, we just want to make sure that um, in making this model available to the, the schools in the area that we have the right um, partnerships in place and the college, uh, I'm sorry, the high school um, really has, um, you know, they're ready to take on the, both the high school and the college course required um, because it is not only just the students, but also the staff who really need to be able to support them in, in making that transition. So which college, which CUNY colleges, which CUNY campuses do not have 
a um, ECI program? Um, at this time, um, I don't think I. Yeah, we, I think we'd have to go back and do process of elimination. We, if you, uh -huh. I think between our partners, we could figure that out uh -huh. in five minutes. Is it okay? So, is it possible for an EC for the uh, a DOE school to transition into an ECI school? As has happened. Did yes. we just do that with City Poly? Yes. Yeah, so um, one of the um, early college schools that um, we're just working with right now is was originally a different type of an early college high school. It was a bit of a more of an accelerated high school program so that they can get the kids to take the college courses earlier. Um, based on just experiences working with that, uh, the school and, and, and new partnerships that came into play, we've been able to convert the school into this new 9 to 14 model. It is still in development, but um, it is something that um, we've, been, we've tried out and we're seeing success, or gr slowly gr seeing success. Um, to my understanding, maybe I'm wrong on this, but um, schools like Townsend Harris and um, Queens High School for Sciences that are on campuses um, are not ECI schools, am I right? That's correct. That's because they're specialized high schools? Correct. And they specialized admission programs into yes. those schools. Okay. Um, how is ECI funded? So the 9 to 14 schools are funded both through the DOE and CUNY. Um, as public high schools, they still receive the fair student funding. Um, as CTE schools, they receive additional funding to make sure they can develop robust CTE programs. Um, we have a cost sharing agreement in place also with CUNY so that we can help defray the cost of the tuition for the students. And um, that includes anywhere from, um, you know, the instructor's salary to the uh, cost related to managing all these prog programs across the city. Um. How much is spent per pupil at an ECI school, for example, versus what's spent for an average student in a regular high school? Um, it's a little difficult to compare. I think every there are just different programs in place. Um, like I mentioned, um, some of our public high schools may offer various programs, um, both CTE, maybe pro performing arts, maybe specialized science programs. So I don't think it, we can do a straight comparison. Um, I, I would just say that the college costs um, aren't directly going into the school budgets. Um, we know that that would just be an additional burden for them. So we, that's something that we handle um, at the institutional level between DOE and CUNY. Is there a difference between the 9 to 12 and the 9 to 14 schools of cost per pupil? I think the main cost differential would be tied to one, this, the costs related to the career and technical education programs within our 9 to 14 schools. And then because uh, the 9 to 14 schools do span into the extra two years, uh, we do fund that portion um, from the DOE. So that would just be the additional cost that goes into these schools compared to the 9 to 12s. How are materials covered for the um, college courses? Uh, books and things like that. Those are um, part of our cost sharing with the, um, with our CUNY partners. So the students do not have to pay for textbooks um, or um, um, the supplies. Those are usually covered directly uh, for this uh, for the students. Does every school offer the opportunity to get the associate's degree, or are college or are, do, do some schools only offer college courses, and then those credits could be transferred? For all uh, 17 um, CUNY schools that we work with, those offer student, all students the opportunity to earn credits towards an associate's degree. And I'm um, curious to know what type of an associate's degree do they graduate with? Is sure. it an associate's, uh, I don't even know, like, uh, is it an associate's degree in science, uh, arts, or how, how is that worded? Sure. So with the, um, um, and I, my, I know my CUNY colleagues can speak more about this later, um, with the 9 to 12s or the 6 to 12 schools, a lot of the um, schools are able to offer the liberal arts per, um, associate's degrees or depending on the student's interest, they may have focused areas. For the 9 to 14 schools, we do focus on STEM-related um, associate degrees. So it can be anything from com computer information systems, civil engineering, um, electromechanical engineering, so very specialized in, um, in a technical area. Those credits, I'm assuming, are also transferable to a, a, a college system outside of CUNY? 
Um, we definitely, we're working with, uh, well, we're looking into how they might be transferring those credits into SUNY systems, and we're beginning to look at how other private colleges also might be willing to accept some of these credits. And Deputy Chancellor, in your uh, remarks, uh, you mentioned that um, the first grades, 9 to 14 schools opened in 2011. Do you have any statistics on that now, how many um, students graduated with the associate's degree? I think we'd have to bring that back to you, I'm sorry to say. Uh, the, we haven't released graduation data for the city for this year, and I don't see it here in our testimony. No, oh, I do see it, 71 out of 97. Graduated by summer of 2017, 47 earned the associate's degree. So some that's, that's with an associate's degree. Yeah, 40, half of them got associate's degrees, um, and 71 out of 97 graduated by the summer of 2017. Okay. I, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my co chair, Councilmember Barron, and uh, let her ask some questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the panel for coming, and I've got lots of questions because I think this is an exciting program. So there are 17 uh, high schools and the two barred schools that make it 19? Okay. And of those 17 schools, is it um, six that have nine to 12 programs? What programs that allow students to graduate after the 12th grade with credits so that there's, there's, go up to perhaps as high as 60? So there's 10 that are ten? CUNY based, there's two that are at BARD, and then there's the seven nine through 14s for a total of 19. So the 10 CUNY based schools are nine to 12 or six to 12. There's some of them that I see start at sixth grade. That's correct. Correct. Okay. In terms of the uh, admission requirements, I heard you say that the 9 to 14, there are no academic requirements. Correct. What about the others, the other 10? Uh, the other 10, the other 12 are, are screened 12. Um, schools. They're what? Screened schools. Screened schools. So that school itself sets the policy. Uh -huh. How does the DOE get involved in setting that policy for screening? Uh, there's a long history of the DOE working with schools to create screens that are functioning for each of the schools. Um, this administration has a great interest in seeing how those screens can become less exclusive and more inclusive. Less, become less? More inclusive. Become more inclusive. I'm particularly interested in Mega Evers Early College High School because I received a call of concern saying that the DOE was intending to change its screening policy without having consulted, involved, or had staff involved in that, and that they were, I believe, requiring them to take more homeless students and more students with disability. That's what was told to me. And some document was also presented in that regard. So Medgar Evers isn't one of the early college high schools in, in this program. Um, I'm not aware of that. I mean, I'm happy to get more information uh, about what ask has been made of Medgar Evers. I think there's a DOE-wide interest in making sure that all of our screen schools served a more serve a more diverse population over time. So you'll find out and get back to me because I don't know that there were other schools that are also going to be involved in this now change or proposed change to their screening. And I would love to get more information about if there's anybody else on your group who's here could answer that. I think our staff will have to go back to our enrollment office to get more details for you. I'd be very pleased to know what that is because their success rate is phenomenal, as other uh, schools in the program have great rates. And it was born out of a struggle, as you know. Mm -hmm. And we're very concerned to make sure that we maintain their success and the great work that they're doing. So I'd appreciate that getting back from that. Now, do you rank your ECI early college uh, schools 
by RCI. Is that how they're ranked by the RCI, the College Readiness Index? I've seen charts that have that ranking of so we, high schools. We've made a great effort not to rank our schools, period. Um, we're trying to provide as much information as we possibly can about all of our schools, both to the school community and to the general public, so that we can inquire and ask um, good questions about our performance and, uh, and about ways in which we can get better. We don't have a ranking system. You don't have rankings. But do you have the CRI for each of the schools that's in this program? We have the CRI for each of the 486 high schools, yes. Okay, I would love to get that listing of the CRIs for each of those schools. Sure. And then, in terms of the courses that are offered in high schools, in these particular high schools, we understand the students have the opportunity to take college courses. Is there also an opportunity for students at these particular schools to take AP classes, and do they take them? And what is the advantage, or um, is there an advantage? So, um, the early colleges do offer, some of the early colleges do offer opportunities for students to take advanced placement courses. Um, we, it's not necessarily something that we feel is, um, of course, necessary because in, in many cases the students. Uh, could you pull the mic a little closer? Sure. Um, in many cases, the students who are taking the college courses are able to earn actual credits, which is the goal for us. Um, there are cases where, for example, it may, the course that a student may be interested in taking for credit right. is not available through right. their particular sequence um, at that school, and so that may be a time when the school might offer an AP course. And I heard you talk about transferring, uh, working to have the credits that students amass in this program to institutions outside of CUNY. If a high school is associated with a particular college, can they just as readily expect that all of the credits they received in their associated college will be accepted? I mean, as a part of the pathway system, is that, do you know if that's something that's happening, or do you want me to save that question? I mean, I think, I think John can speak to that more okay. deeply. I know that CUNY is very interested in making sure that the credits are credit worthy wherever they go. Okay. And who pays for the textbooks? I didn't quite get that answer. The textbooks that for classes, co college courses that students that's, are taking? That's covered by the DOE and CUNY. The DOE? DOE and, and CUNY. CUNY, yes. And CUNY. Yes. And I really would like to get a better understanding, it wasn't clear to me, um, how we can calculate the cost, sure. the additional cost to run an ECI school as opposed to the regular high school. That's something we'll be happy to come back to you with. Okay. And what's the um, difference between the, uh, what is it, the ECI and the early college high school? So exam for example, you have these 19 schools here, um, but there are others that are considered early college high schools, I believe, they're the smart science at Megger, the City Polytech. So is that a separate program? It's not, well, those are funded through, so there is a uh, grant through the New York State Education Department right. called the Smart Scholars Program. Um, there are a couple of in schools within New York City that are funded through that program. Um, a couple of our current CUNY and DOE schools, uh, I'm sorry, the 9 to 14s, um, also fall under that category. We particularly have been focusing on the 19 schools where we know that they've um, definitely been offering um, college courses that lead up to an associate's degree or the sequence has been designed so that students are able to complete an uh, associate's degree within their time at the high school. So yes, there are other programs offered um, and it really ranges from offering um, you know, a small set of courses or um, they may have a particular relationship with uh, universities that um, we have not been directly involved with in terms of the coordination of the relationships, but um, we definitely are um, aware that there are other early colleges with, well, schools offering other types of college. So Mega Evers College High School is not a part of these 19 schools? Correct. Correct. Yes. It is not. Yes, it is not. 
<laughs> yes, we have no bananas. <laughs> okay. Um, so the other concern that I have is that, according to the data that I've seen, yes, uh, students remain in college, remaining in college two years after high school graduation is 42% for ECI schools, but only 4% receive an associate's degree. That's the data that I have, which is um, concerning and troubling. So yes, we have 42% of ECI college students remaining um, in college, but the data that I have says only 4% receive an associate's degree. And that's troubling to me or puzzling to me because if they come in with so many more credits and if I think 20 credits is an indicator that a student can expect to go forward, so in terms of how we're going to evaluate the success of the program. Uh, I think it's a fair question around uh, long-term evaluation and I'd love to sit with my partners from CUNY and talk about how we're going to process that information and see whether that's an accurate number. Okay. And I believe that CUNY will be talking about it in its testimony. Okay. And um, mm -hmm. the other piece that I have is that moving on, which is a related question, moving on to four-year colleges, four-year college programs, uh, it's 71% at CUNY, 71% at CUNY, so we're looking to see if we can get that graduation rate as well. So we can perhaps get that from my colleagues at the CUNY panel. And finally, um, what's the average number of credits, college credits, that students have? when they graduate from an ECI school, that's one of the 10 that are nine to 12. It's a great What's the question. average number of college credits? It's a have? great question that we'd have to come back to you with, but we can, we can pull that, or you might even know it soon. 30. I believe it's 30. I was thinking hard on that, <laughs> so. Average okay. number. Hmm. That's even more puzzling to me why then more students don't Get out. And, but I do, I do have some uh, great news in terms of the um, student on-time graduation rate uh, is 86% for ECI schools, and it's even higher for black students at 89%. That's a switch. And so this is great, a problem, a great program that we're looking at in terms of closing that gap for black and Latino students. And we do see that the region scores are higher and that the ELA and math scores are improved. So we think that it's a good program, some accomplishments. We want to be able to get some long range analysis uh, from this as well. And if you could forward those answers and certainly would like to know, I think the chair asked the question, how did it get started? I would certainly like to know more about its beginnings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and just to follow up a little bit on, on, on what your questions, uh, where, where you were heading with some of this. For the students enrolled in grades nine to 14, what percentage of students leave school at grade 12? Would you know that? Uh, that's definitely a great question. Um, we just had our uh, first P-TECH graduates um, this past June, and then um, two additional schools just met their four-year uh, fourth year. Um, we're still working on getting that data, which is um, being finalized. We'll be happy to share that once it's publicly available. All right, thank you. Um, Councilmember Avaca has questions. Yes, hi. Now, followed by Councilmember Kalos. Thank you. I just wanted to ask several questions. First of all, where are the 9 to 14 schools in the Bronx? In the Bronx? Hero High is in the South Bronx. Um, Where is that? I'm sorry. Hero High is in the, Hero High. It's in the South Bronx. It's in. Is it on the Evander Childs campus? Same in Gompers. It's on the Gompers campus. That's the only program we have in the Bronx. It's the only nine through fourteen. Nine through fourteen. How many? And how many nine through fourteens again? We There's have. There's seven nine through fourteens. Seven. Are there plans for a second one? Because I'd like one in my district. To be very honest with you. Sure. Uh, uh, there are plans that. Uh, to try to expand the 9 through 14s. 
over the next um, couple of years, and we're looking at underrepresented areas. Um, well, I have an, up, an underrepresented area. That's great. And you can Thank take you. care of it. So. All right, thanks. I'm prepared to meet with you. I can think of several principals that would be interested. All right, we so appreciate the input. Let's partner soon because I'm leaving in three months, so we have to do this very quickly. All right. Okay. I wanted to ask you how many of the students in the 9 to 14, what's the percentage of students in the 9 to 14 schools that go on to a four-year college? So the 9 through 14 is a new, uh, relatively new experiment. We have, of the seven schools, one school has been in existence for six years and two schools have been in existence for four years. So we have limited data to talk to you about their ongoing attainment. What, do we have any details we can share right now? Just for PTEC, we have the graduation uh, information I told you before, and 62% of the kids who are graduating are, are enrolling in four-year colleges at CUNY. 64%? 62. 62%. Of the one class of students we're talking about from PTEC, the original school. Okay. What college in the Bronx is the sponsoring college for your existing facility of 9 through 14? Bronx community or is it? It's hostos. It's, that one's at Hostos. It's, with Mont, it's at Hostos with Montefiore Hospital as the industry partner. Okay. What are students really interested in in the 9 to 14 school in the Bronx or anywhere else? Are they more, are they, what's the prevalence? Is it just generally uh, liberal arts subjects or is there a, a trade? That's interest? a medical profession school. Um, is, um, they can get an associate's degree that leads them to the field of medical, to medical professions fields. The school that's, um, yes, so the school, 914 school in the Bronx is focusing on nursing and community health. Now, when you're in the, when you're in the ninth, when you're in the eighth grade, you have to go through a high school selection process that involves a lottery system. It involves your name coming up somehow and being given a school. Do you have a wait list for the, for the 9 to 14 school that you have in the Bronx when the uh, students do high school applications? Is there, um, uh, what is the demand? Because I'm sure students know about this. It must be in the high school directory that this is a 9 to 14 school. So have you looked at the wait list to determine the demand that could exist beyond what we have now? So we have high demand for every single one of these programs. At Hero, the total number of applicants was 977 this past year, and the total number of seats we had available was 142, um, 119 enrolled. Okay. My last question is, what is the Just degree before you go on, Councilman, I'm going to interrupt you, too. Uh, how do you go about publicizing the program? And we looked at the school finder, and it was a little difficult to figure mm -hmm. out exactly what was being offered, et cetera, so forth and so on. So we're curious to know as a follow-up to what Councilmember Vaca is asking. Sure. So all our 9 to 14 schools do participate in the borough and the citywide high school fairs. Um, that's a huge opportunity for them to um, really meet students from across the city. Um, in addition, we host the Career and Technical Education High School Fair that has been a new initiative under this administration that has up, and this year it's coming up um, this Saturday. Um, so the students really get a chance to speak about, and current students do participate in these fairs so that they can reach out to um, the eighth graders to talk about why it's unique to come to the 9 to 14 schools. In addition, all the schools host their own open houses. Um, many of them also um, you know, provide information sessions for parents specifically in, in different languages so that they have an opportunity to learn about it if they are not English speakers. Just, just to go back to one or two things, I know uh, it was mentioned, but is space an issue? The students technically stay in the high school for the two years, or do they take a combined type of presence, do they go both to high school and college? Um, how does that work? Sure, at the years five and six point, um, they more likely spend their time on the college campus. So while they may come back to the high school um, for various seminars, for check-ins with their advisors, the students are expected to spend more time um, on the college campus. 
Um, I would say that when we were initially developing these schools, we had accounted for the fact that there might be some needs for the additional space during those periods, so that was accounted for, but um, as always, space is a premium in the city. So um, we do want to make sure that the students do have an opportunity to come back and, and see their high school um, advisors um, on a regular basis, so we, we make sure that space is available for them. And my last question is, I would think that in an, in an endeavor like this, you'd have to have a large degree of parental involvement. Is there a component that deals with keeping parents involved and in touch with their students' progress, uh, starting maybe in grade nine? There has to be a buy-in from parents because this is such a unique program. Absolutely. So. Um, there are various ways we've been doing this. One, at the institutional level, CUNY and the DOE has been collaborating on creating an FAQ for parents so that they have an understanding of what is involved in attending a school, um, a, in a 9 to 14 school, and that document has been translated in all nine languages and also distributed at the high school fairs. Um, the schools individually host different programs so that they can really meet the needs of their particular parent population. Some may host, um, annual student conference events or dinners where they have the opportunity to bring the parents together with their students and meet with faculty so that they can talk about um, where their students are currently, what they need to be doing academically or getting additional support so that they can advance in their um, college courses or in their high school academics. Um, there are schools that host monthly um, meeting or what they call coffee sessions with the principal, so it's an opportunity for them to check in to learn about different supports and um, initiatives that are offered directly to the parents. So um, every school is approaching this in a different way based on um, who their parents are, where their students, you know, families are located. But yes, we definitely see parental engagement as a huge and necessary component for the success of the 914s. Is there adequate representation from uh, students who have special needs, or is there an outreach that's done in that regard to make sure that there's an uh, equitable representation? And then 9 through 14s there is. Sorry? In the, in the seven 9 through 14 schools, we see a diversity pattern that reflects the city, yes, in, this, in those seven. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And just to follow up again, uh, because we did a little experiment on the school finder, and when we put in words like associate degree versus associates with an apostrophe S versus early college, it came up with all different results um, of what's available. So when you do the training, how, what do you tell students to search under or parents to search under? So we will certainly speak to our colleagues in enrollment and try to get you an answer for how we train students to use the, and families to use the school finder. Okay, because that can be quite confusing in terms of what's offered um, when that search is done. All right, let's go to uh, Councilmember Kalos, followed by Cabrera. Thank you to our chairs to calling attention to this issue and just following along on uh, the chair's question. Uh, so this reflects specific schools that are participating in your program. I went to a high school in the Bronx across the street from Lehman, across Harris Field from Lehman, and a lot of our students uh, took classes there, and we happened to be friends with kids just down the block from City Hall who are across the street from BMCC. Is any of that, and, and, and took a lot of classes, and I think in both cases we had some overachievers that may have graduated back in the 90s with an associates in high school. Uh, if you could just share what the reporting is there and how those programs happen, whether officially or unofficially. So the reporting on the non-early college schools where students still take courses at CUNY. I think that our colleagues from CUNY are prepared to speak about that more deeply than we are right now. So I should say that if, if you can just email me with the response. I, I won't be here at the same time as you, sadly. Uh, I think the uh, other quick uh, question along that is, so this looks like a tremendous opportunity, however, even at the high school in the Bronx that I went to where a lot of the kids were gifted and talented, you turn 16, 
what's the point to school, some might question, and a lot of kids just are done with it. And a lot of the folks that I knew, particularly folks who didn't come um, from wealthy neighborhoods or didn't come from nuclear families or in multi-generational households, really felt the pressure to go get a trades degree and go out there and earn income from the family. And in fact, a number of us, including myself, were working part-time, sometimes full-time, just to be able to afford to go to high school, uh, which is a reality in this city. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the opportunity for targeting kids who are at risk of dropping out or stop showing up to school and coming to them and saying, uh, you know what, we will help you with your GED, we will pay for you to go to CUNY for the next two years if, if you come back to DOE. You don't have to set foot in the high school again, but we want you to get your associates between now and when you're 18. And while we technically have some responsibility for you so that when a f child wants to exit, and at 16 though they can exit, I still think they're children. Yeah, I mean dropout prevention is a key component of the work that we're doing. The dropout rate is, has been dropping year after year uh, since 2014. Um, I love your idea. All right, if you're offering us the funding to do it, that's fantastic. Um, the, we want to make sure we have as many options available to as many students to find their way to complete their education because we, like you know, that the completion of um, the high school credential and some kind of post-secondary experience is essential to the health and well-being of the whole city, not just that one young person. So that, that I'm, I'm glad we have a meeting of the minds. How much would it cost? We'd have to get back to you to talk about paying, uh, bringing kids back and offering them, kids who are at risk and offering them opportunity to co-enroll in CUNY while at the same time as completing their high school GED. I, I think it's parallel to this program. The only difference yes. is in one case they kid has chosen to be at one of your schools that has this program versus thousands of other high schools where this program doesn't exist. So I guess what is the current cost for your program and how many at risk, what's the current cost for your program, how many participants, how many at risk kids, yeah. and then we can extrapolate. So we are, we've promised to bring you current costs as, um, as quickly as we can and I think cutting it by at risk students which is a definition that changes depending on who's asking the question. Um, we will happily look at that as well um, and, and try to tie it to costs, absolutely. Do you know how many kids dropped out last year? Of the city, it's below 8% now, is that about right? I think we're, we've, it's, it's gone down steadily in the last three or four years and it's around, the dropout rate I believe was 8% last year, but we'd have to check just to make certain. So 8% of around 60,000, so around 48, sorry, 480? Four, it would be 8% would be 4,800. Okay, so, so 4,800. How many? It's 8.5, so 5,100, sorry. Um, and so, sorry, I missed so, so So we're talking about 5,000 or so kids, and so extra, and then how much the associates programs cost to, I mean, in general, we can, we can do a year's worth of CUNY tuition to start to know the baseline cost. Um, plus, you're talking about intelligently that there needs to be some uh, baseline support for students who have had non-success in high school to make sure that they can not just take advantage of this opportunity, but meet the needs of that opportunity if it's presented. So it, it would be a very different kind of early college program than has been designed before. It's a really interesting idea, um, but it requires, it would require funding CUNY tuition and funding a school. Okay. And I think similarly, are there any budget lines DOE-wide in terms of paying kids to go to school? Because when you're choosing between supporting your family, keeping you in your home, or waking up the next day in a homeless shelter versus going to school mm -hmm. and providing for your family, there, there really may not be a choice there. Oh, I struggled with that when I was leading school. I, I, I hear what you're saying. There is the only money I know that goes directly from the DOE to students is money for internships um, while they're especially in some of our CTE programs. Um, I don't know of a program we have right now where students are uh, financially um, taken care of to keep them in school. 
Thank you. Sure. Okay, Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, just a few questions. I just need point of clarification here. Uh, what's the difference between uh, DOE versus CUNY running the programs? Is there a difference? So it's, I mean, we are co-running this experience for, for young people. In every school? In each of these places where students are enrolled in CUNY um, and, and in the Bard School as well. The, we, have, we, have, we share responsibility for the students experiences across institutions. Okay, and then you mentioned something that got me a little confused. Do they do they they do nine and tenth grade in high school and then what happens in eleventh grade? So they will still continue um, you know finishing all their high school course requirements in nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Um, the expectation is though that the courses that they uh, the college courses will pick up more once they hit 11th and 12th grade, so they may And how many is that normally? Um, again, it ranges, but uh, we try to balance between a full course load that the students have to manage at the high school and the college. Students may be taking anywhere from two to three or four courses in their 11th grade and even more at so grade. do the college courses count towards the graduation, high school graduation? How do they meet the full requirement for that? There may be courses, and the schools definitely look into this, where they may be able to offer dual credits. So the co college course that they take in, say, English may also apply towards their high school requirement. How is this different from AP courses? I would say with AP courses, one of the... Um, challenges that a lot of the students' performance really relies on this one final test that they take at the end, whereas with the college courses, they are really getting a full semester or year's worth of experience as a college student. There are different points within which they are able to demonstrate their performance and um, you know, the credits that they're able to accumulate at the end, they can definitely transfer into you know, CUNY or SUNY or whatever college that they may advanced to. Um, with AP credits, I think it's at the discretion of the college that they go to. So it, we feel it's much more advantageous for them to be able to earn a college credit. And what's the plan for expansion? Is, do we have a clear pathway trajectory of where we're going here? So the plan right now is to expand to three, at least three more, nine through 14s. And right now the DOE is in discussions that will include CUNY around what, where those 9 through 14 should be located, what the industry partner should be, and which uh, CUNY campus would like to be involved. I, I want to join the, uh, the chorus here regarding, look, I, I think part of the big problem that we have in just about any system that you come into is transition. I think that this program uh, does a fantastic job in creating a real bridge. Uh, it's working. I'm just wondering why not look at it at a system-wide uh, possibility uh, because it's costing us more money uh, for students not to succeed, not just in the short term, but in the long term, that the possible millions of dollars we would have to expend uh, to expand it into every school. Do, do, you, do you see the possibility, let's say if, if funding was not an issue, this working in every school? I think if, if we're talking about a world in which funding is not an issue, we would love to have our students in DOE schools have more and more opportunity to live in the world of post-secondary education and make sure they know what they're transitioning to and what they need to do in order to transition to something. We, one of the things about young people that's true, terrible sense, that when there is something that people work toward, they do better work when they know what the end of their work is. The exciting thing about these programs is that we're revealing to students what the future could look like to them, and it allows them to be 
um, inside this conversation around why education is necessary, why career experience is necessary for them to, to make smart choices about their own lives. And so if this was more widely available to young people, this would be a boon for our city, yes. I, I agree with you. I think that they will see a greater value uh, for their investment in sticking to school and to have consistency in school. This is why I think that we should start considering in the future, and when I mean the future, I don't mean uh, four years from now. I mean starting now to see, because to be honest with you, three is not going to have a huge impact, three schools. I, I, uh, how much does it cost to do each school? So we, we have to come back to you with uh, specific information. There are myriad of costs involved. But I mean, I, what's the ballpark? You gotta, I, I can't. Mm -hmm. And you're running this program. I'm surprised you don't know how much it costs yeah, uh, to run each of the program. What's like the ballpark? We have a million dollars. We have a million dollar, million and a half communicated to CUNY. I'm not. To run all 17 schools or no. per school? So uh, for the college, just for the college portion, I would say it's approximately 1.3 to 1.5 million um, just for the 17 schools yeah. with CUNY. I think it's, it's, but, it's a deeper cost than that because of the number of, of students. We are going to have to sit with CUNY and give you better okay. information, and there's a separate fiscal arrangement with Bart. Does TAP and Pell pick up anything here? No, they do not. With kids do don't, not. don't use their TAP and Pell money here. It is one of the lovely things about the program in that the tap and pell money is still available to students. It's really a generous and And how many high schools do we have in the city right now? There are 10 CUNY early college high schools. There's seven 9 through 14s, and there's two high schools run by Bard. You know? No, no, I'm talking about a DOE altogether. How many high schools? 486 or so. 486, so we're talking about 400,000 and plus. Even if we were to do half of that to start with, what, can you imagine the impact that we would have in the students creating a real bridge, creating that hope, that vision where the students could see, I'm going to get a college degree when I finish here. It's something that we should seriously uh, talk about. And to be honest with you, it's not a lot of money in the scheme of things when we have, what's the budget now, uh, uh, Chair Drum, right now for... The DOE is the twenty-six billion dollars, so, so, so like something like that. I mean, this would greatly increase, increase high school graduation and end up with a college degree. I would have loved to have that when I was in, uh, finishing high school and have a college degree. That would have been amazing. Thank you so much. Look, I, I appreciate all the work that you're doing. I'm, the reason why I'm talking this way because I do believe in what you're doing, and uh, and we should definitely expand it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, these are good questions, and uh, we will follow up with uh, the DOE on that. And I know, uh, in particular, in my discussions with Bard, also the um, the the amount of money that Bard is getting to offer these programs has been a concern to them and to this to this committee as well. So, thank you, Councilmember Barron, Chair Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A few more questions. You talked about students being able to realize that there's more that they can do and there's a bigger world. A lot of that also has to do with students connecting to the teacher, the ethnicity of the teacher. And we know that predominantly black and Latino students are, make up the majority of student population in DOE. What do we know to be, or do we have data about the ethnicity of both the teachers in these ECI schools and I'll ask CUNY about the uh, CUNY staff. I certainly don't have that information available today about the 19 schools. Okay, uh, if you could get that to us, we would appreciate that. And a few other questions. I see that there are two schools that are nine to 13. I believe International High School at LaGuardia is nine to 13, mm -hmm. and the Middle College High School at LaGuardia is nine to 13. So is it, the same concept as 9 to 14, but it's condensed or consolidated into a year, or is? Um, those two schools are still part of the, what we've been counting as part of the 9 to 12s for CUNY, but they do offer an extra year for the students to be able to finish their associate's degree. Um, they are different from the 9 to 14s in that they are not necessarily focusing on a career in technical education. Um, international high school is focused, and 
course, my CUNY colleagues will speak, can speak more about this, but International High School does serve um, a predominantly ELs or um, population of students who have recently come to the United States. So um, they are working with students who may also be um, academically behind. And in terms of schools that are 9 to 14, can a student accelerate? Can they finish a year ahead? Can they consolidate classes or on there the other hand? Um, there are definitely examples where students who are much more um, okay. high achieving have been accelerating and taking on. And when a student is in the 9 to 14, that last year or a year and a half, do they have to go to school full time? Since they are still enrolled as high school DOE students, um, yes, we do want them to be attending school full time. Are you talking about the years five and six? Say again. Are you? Yes, yes, that's last. Oh, okay. Um, so, for the years five and six, if they are taking the college courses, that's going to predominantly be um, where they're going to be focusing their instructional time. Okay, and how long is the process for a high school that's interested in being a part of the ECI? How long does that process take for a high school to contact you and say, we want to be a part of that program? And what do they have to do to be a part of that program? It's, uh, there isn't a straight answer to that question. There's a lot of fiscal considerations and enrollment. Con That's interesting. There are a lot of fiscal considerations, but yet you're not able to give us you know, the data that we're asking you for. Yeah, so I, I it seems like. We'll, we will get you that data. I, am, I do apologize about that. Okay, and then um, we, your, your population is to help, your, part of your goal, your purpose is to reduce remediation. And we know that many of these students are in need of support, not just the academic, but social as well. So what do you offer to students to help give them what they need? So at the 9 to 14 schools, that's definitely a huge focus, um, both in supporting them academically and in their social emotional development. Um, as an example, one, the Hero High School in the Bronx, they have actually assigned or hired um, social workers for every single grade so that they can provide that type of wraparound support because they know that that's a huge factor in making sure that the students are able to engage and stay in school. Um, in other schools, um, they may be offering, uh, one of our schools has been working with um, Include NYC, which is an organization in, in New York City uh, focusing on helping students to transition as their students with disabilities or students with IEPs so that they have ways where um, if the school itself may not be able to support, the, that they are able to provide the um, referral service or um, community-based support for the students. So, the schools are all working on different strategies that meet the needs of their particular population. Okay, and I think this is my final question. I looked at the data that you gave us in terms of the 19 ECI schools, and when looking at those that are part of the 9 to 12 model, which allows a student to graduate from high school with up to 60, but on an average of 30 credits, which is great. I noticed that the trend of the black enrollment at these schools has gone down. So for example, the Brooklyn College Academy, which has been in existence from 2012 to 2017, has dropped from 75% black to 68%. And uh, also at City College Academy, there's a very small population of black students, only 5% on an average, which has dropped down now to 4% of black students. At Hostos, another one of the schools where it's 9 to 12, it's dropped from 22 to 20% black enrollment. And at, uh, my lines are crossing here. Oh, the Manhattan Hunter Science School, it's dropped from 60, I'm sorry, from 20% black to 16%. And most alarmingly, at York Early College Academy, it's dropped from 63% to 47%. So those are disturbing trends that I'm looking at in terms of enrollment of black students who have the ability to graduate from high school 
with a significant number of college credits. So I would like to get some explanation for that. And if you could get back to me, I would appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Barron. Uh, just as uh, f my final question, um, I think Stuyvesant students go to the borough of Manhattan Community College and students from Bronx Science go to Lehman. Is that part of the ECI program? It is not. No, it's separate? Is, it, is it DOE involved in that? I th Say again? There, I mean, one easy way that it happens is through the College Now program, which you might be, fam which you might be familiar with. Um, there are other institutions that make agreements, institution to institution, to allow kids to articulate in a limited way. So that's between the high school itself and the, and the, and the CUNY college? Does that, we have more formal arrangements, like through our College Now program, that okay. really capture a, a much wider swath of the city's um, students than any one of these particular programs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to stop here with this panel and then bring up our next panel. I'm sorry, we've been joined by Councilmember Salamanca, Deutsch, and Garadnik. Uh, Garadnik, excuse me. <laughs> yes. And uh, I want to thank this panel for coming in. And uh, we look forward to our next panel, which is John Mogulescu from the uh, Senior University Dean of Academic Affairs at CUNY, Cass Conrad University. Dean K-16 Initiatives at CUNY, Tracy Muren, the principal at Kingsborough Early College Secondary School, and Lyra Marshall, former student and a current teacher at Kingsborough Early College and Secondary, Early College Secondary School, to come up. And while they're coming up, I did want to read a statement from Councilmember Debbie Rose, who unfortunately can't make this hearing, but is on the committee uh, because she's in Staten Island this morning uh, and there was a conflict in her schedule. So from Council Member De Debbie Rose, it says, with more than 60% of jobs nationwide requ requiring post-secondary education, it is paramount to our students, it is paramount our students obtain higher education so that they can remain competitive in today's market. However, soaring post-secondary tuition costs have forced our youth to question the value of obtaining such a degree, but providing our students with a free opportunity to earn associate degree while still in high school, we are ensuring that every child can pursue a higher education regardless of their socioeconomic status. This is one of the reasons why my vision for the North Shore of Staten Island includes an education complex that begins at pre-K and continues through to an associate's degree. Having spent much of my career working to keep at-risk youth in school, I understand the importance of higher education and the obligation we have to put our students on the best path to success by investing in programming to enable them to graduate with not only a high school diploma, but their associate's degree as well. And that's from Councilmember Debbie Rose. So thank you for coming in today, and I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand so I can swear you all in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Okay, and so who would like to start? Yes. And just you have to hit that mic with them, but make sure that red light's on. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm John Mogulescu, the Senior University Dean for Academic Affairs and Dean of the CUNY School of Professional Studies. Uh, let me start by thanking both Chair Drum and Barron for hosting today's hearing. I think we'll do our best to testify and also fill in some of the gaps and answer some of the questions perhaps that our DOE colleagues were, were not able to, to answer. I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak here today. Uh, let me just mention I also appreciate the Council's strong support of CUNY over the years, particularly this year's support of our efforts to reform remediation at the colleges and the funding and support you provided has helped us to develop new policies and curricula that we believe will make a significant difference in our students' success rate. Uh, the City University of New York and the New York City Department of Education uh, are deeply connected uh, by the students they serve. Uh, you, you know that roughly 60% of DOE graduates who go to college attend a CUNY college. Approximately 78% of first-time freshmen at CUNY are graduates of DOE schools. As part of uh, our chancellor's recently announced strategic framework, CUNY clearly recognizes that the Department of Ed is its most important partner and pledges to work closely with it to help ensure 
that a larger number of entering students are prepared for success, starting with early childhood education, assisting them up to and through high school. Uh, CUNY's Office of K-16 Initiatives is home to the Early College Initiative, as we've talked about in all of our programs that serve DOE students. In 2016-17, these programs together served over 50,000 students from more than 500 schools throughout the city. These nationally recognized programs aim to improve success rates and ease the transition from K-12 public school to college and beyond. I'd like to take a moment to remind you of some of the important work we're doing in this area, even beyond the early college high schools. Uh, college Now, which came up briefly at the end of the uh, DOE's testimony, is CUNY's largest dual enrollment program, enlisting 17 colleges and 420 or so New York City high schools in its mission to prepare students for high school graduation and college success. The program offers college credit courses, preparatory courses, workshops, summer programs, and access to campuses and cultural offerings free of charge to over 21,000 students each year. CUNY Prep is an innovative college preparatory school that offers out-of-school youth an alternative pathway to college. CUNY Prep offers a full-time program for students aged 16 to 18 in which students take core classes in math, science, writing, and social studies and work to earn their high school equivalency diploma. Once successful, students move into College Transition Academy. And finally, the third phase of the program, the College Success Network, supports students while in college. CUNY Explorers enables all New York City middle school students to visit a CUNY college campus. At least once during their middle school years, the program helps students understand that college is for everyone, college is affordable, and that middle school students, with the support of their families and school staff, can take steps now to become college ready. In 1617, the Explorers program on 10 CUNY campuses will serve 22,000 seventh graders. Uh, at full capacity, the program will serve approximately 80,000 students annually. Finally, CUNY's LINK program serves high school seniors who are on track to graduate but have not met traditional benchmarks for college readiness. The program trains high school teachers to teach specifically designed senior year math and English courses that prepare students for CUNY's placement exams. Students also receive support to complete the FAFSA and the CUNY online applications. Together, all these programs demonstrate the university's commitment to the young people of our city and to provide, providing access to a high-quality college education. CUNY, founded on the basis of equity and social justice, remains a national exemplar of the ideals of public higher education. I'd be happy to provide additional details about the programs in your questions and afterwards as well. But now I'd like to introduce Cass Conrad, University Dean for K-16 Initiatives at CUNY. We'll provide more detail on our work to support the early college initiative schools. Thank you, John, for that introduction. And I would like to say thank you to the chairs and the committee members for this opportunity to speak with you today. I'm Cass Conrad, the University Dean for K-16 Initiatives at CUNY. I've had the privilege to work with our early college schools since I started at CUNY in 2004. CUNY's Early College Initiative was founded on the belief that all students deserve the opportunity to attend engaging schools that help them successfully transition from high school to college to challenging 21st century careers. Working with CUNY colleges and our partners in the Department of Education, the Early College Initiative, or ECI, develops innovative schools with integrated support systems that help ensure success for all students. New York City has one of the highest concentrations of early college schools in the country. Nearly 9,000 students are enrolled in CUNY's network of 17 early college schools, each of which is partnered with a CUNY college. The ECI schools help students from a broad range of backgrounds earn both a high school diploma and an associate degree or up to two years of college at no cost to themselves and their families. The schools are specifically designed to support low-income youth, first-generation college goers, English language learners, and other groups that have historically been underrepresented in higher education. In large measure, the population of the early college schools matches the neighborhoods in which they are located. Approximately 35% of the students are black and 40% are Hispanic. Just over half, 52%, are male. About 15% of the early college students have an IEP, 
and 7% are English language learners. <coughs> Early college students take carefully selected college credit courses as part of their regular curriculum. These courses are offered during the school day, and many of them count for both high school and college credit. By making campus life and college level work a part of every student's high school experience, early college schools eliminate the financial, academic, and psychological hurdles that prevent too many students from entering and succeeding in college. <coughs> Excuse me. Although all 17 early college schools share this common design principle, there are a few differences among the schools. Six schools, and this I'm going to clarify a little bit from the uh, testimony earlier this morning. Six schools begin in the sixth grade and continue through the twelfth grade. Four schools begin in the ninth grade and continue through the twelfth or thirteenth year. And seven schools begin in the ninth grade and allow students to stay for up to six years or until the fourteenth year. This last group, the nine to fourteen schools, include PTAC and others that have both a college and career focus. Regardless of the grade configuration, all early college schools feature a program that seamlessly integrates high school and college courses. For example, at the York Early College Academy, or YECA, in Jamaica, Queens, students often begin taking college courses in the 10th grade. Typically, they would start with an introduction to poetry course, and then in the 11th and 12th grade, they would build on that foundation by adding English, math, arts, and social science courses. This scaffolded approach is one element that contributes to the student's success. Instead of abruptly moving from a high school environment to a college campus, as is the case for graduates of most high schools, ECI students begin with one college course so that they can learn the different expectations placed on college students in a much more supported manner. Additionally, unlike some traditional schools in which only high achieving students are selected for accelerated or honors courses, ECI schools expect that all students will have the opportunity to earn college credits while in high school. This expectation creates a culture that supports and encourages students who might struggle in other environments. Thinking again about Yucca, this culture of success for all is evident in their outcomes. On average, students earn 47 college cred credits by the time they graduate. That's more than the typical CUNY student earns in the first, their first two years of college. Across all the early college schools, the on-time high school graduation rate is 92%, and the average graduate has earned 30 college credits. That's an important milestone that helps them on their way to a college degree and helps them now meet the expectations of the Excelsior Scholarship. Because ECI schools work with both community colleges and senior colleges, students from about half the schools have the opportunity to earn an associate degree by the time they graduate. In 2016, roughly 16% of the graduates from those schools did just that and graduated with both high school diploma and associate degree. As some of the newer 9 to 14 schools reach maturity, we expect that number to increase. Any ECI graduate who has earned more than 16 credits, which is about two-thirds of our most recent cohort, has the ability to apply to CUNY as a transfer student. This status helps ensure that most, if not all, of their credits transfer and acknowledges the fact that students have a significant amount of college experience under their belts. Given that level of experience, roughly two-thirds of the graduates from the ECI schools enroll in four-year colleges immediately. Our research shows that the benefit of early college credits continues to help students well beyond their high school experience. Alumni of early college schools enter with more credits, earn credits in, a co in college at a faster rate, and are more likely to stay enrolled. This boost to their momentum helps them reach college graduation at higher rates than their peers. Nearly 1,000 students from these schools have earned college degrees at CUNY in the last 10 years. We are so very proud of all that they've accomplished. And just to give you, I know the question has been uh, asked several times this morning about their graduation rate. It's approximately 30% of the early college graduates have earned a college degree or more than one degree by the time, by four years after their high school graduation. And another 30 35% of the students remain enrolled in college at that point in time. In 2013, President 
uh, Barack Obama highlighted the early college model in his State of the Union address and described the remarkable goals of PTAC and other similar schools. In that speech, he stated, we need to give every American student opportunities like this. We couldn't agree more, and we would love to have the opportunity to expand this model to more schools and more students throughout New York City. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Ms. Tracy Marin, the principal of the Kingsboro Early College Secondary School. I've known Tracy since 2005 when she became one of the founding teachers at that school. Over the years, she has developed into an exceptional educator and leader, and we are proud of all the work that she has done for the students of KECSS. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tracy Moran, and I'm the principal of the Kingsborough Early College Secondary School, or as we fondly call it, KECSS. KECSS was founded in 2006 in partnership with the DOE and the CUNY Early College Initiative. We are an unscreened school that serves grades 6 to 12 and provides students with the opportunity to earn a tuition-free associate's degree from Kingsborough Community College. Our goal has been to provide college access to students who traditionally have been underrepresented in college. 73% of our students come from families who fall below the poverty line and as a result qualify for free or reduced lunch. 50% of our student body is black or Hispanic and 20% of our students have special needs. At KECSS, we have worked closely with our staff and CUNY liaison to develop traditions and systems to infuse college and career readiness into all that we do. All of our students are part of an advisory group beginning the summer of sixth grade. In advisory, students receive personalized attention from their advisor with the curriculum focusing on character development, team building, and developing the academic skills they need to be successful in their college courses. Advisory is also a place where students begin to explore their career interests and participate in events such as our annual student-run college fair and student-led conferences. By taking part in these activities, students develop the skills our staff believes they need to be successful in the ECI model. For the last 11 years, we have worked very closely with the faculty at Kingsborough to plan a scope and sequence that maximizes the potential of our students and ensures that they have the tools to be successful high school and college students. We ensure that our high school curriculum aligns with our college curriculum so that our students are better able to meet the behavioral expectations and academic rigors of college coursework. This is no easy task, but these conversations are woven into the cultural fabric of our school. Our teachers understand that they are a crucial part of the journey to that associate's degree, and they take that responsibility very seriously. In order to ensure that our students have the foundational literacy and numeracy skills required for success in college courses, we offer math and literacy interventions all throughout our middle school. The goal of these intervention programs are to ensure that our students do not require remediation for their college courses. Through programs such as guided reading, IXL, and Just Words, we are able to address instructional gaps and make sure that students reach college readiness standards before they begin the college portion of their journey at KECSS. We have experienced substantial success with our mission as our 2016-2017 graduation rate reached 96 percent, with 70 percent of our students earning a full associate's degree from Kingsborough Community College. Because the Early College Initiative makes transfer of college credits so seamless for our graduates, over 90% of our graduates move on to four-year CUNY institutions to earn bachelor's degrees and pursue career paths of their choice. As a legacy teacher and now the principal, I feel blessed and fortunate to work with students who are excited to learn, are grateful for the opportunity they have been given, and are dedicated to their goals. This program provides students not only with college credits, but with the self-confidence, determination, and self-advocacy skills to become independent, successful members of the larger community. It is now my pleasure to introduce Liara Marshall, one of my former KCSS students, who I'm very proud to say is now a colleague. Good morning. Welcome to all city officials, organizers of today's testimony, and to everyone who is in attendance here today. I am Liara Marshall, and I'm a graduate of KECSS Legacy Class, the first cohort of students to graduate from the school. 
When I was 11 years old and leaving elementary school, I was picked in a lottery to attend Kingsborough Early College Secondary School. At that time, I had no desire to attend this school. I wanted to remain with my fellow schoolmates from primary school, my dance club, and I wanted to attend the designated area secondary school. Thank God for the wisdom and insistence of my grandmother as she made sure that I held my chin up and forged, and forged ahead. At 11 years of age, I just didn't realize the impact that this great opportunity will have upon my life. As soon as I entered school on the first day, I knew what a great decision it was to attend KECSS. Throughout my years there, I could always rely on the fact that my school was providing me with the skills and support system I would need to be successful in the program. I began taking my first college class, which was a health class, between the summer of eighth grade, eighth and ninth grade. The feeling of taking my first college class was surreal. I couldn't believe I was being taught by a college professor at the age of 13. My freshman and sophomore year of high school, I was young and still learning how to function as a college student, so professors came to our school to teach us. When they left each day, I could rely on the support of my high school teachers to ensure I was successful in those early classes. In 11th grade, I traveled to the campus for class, and by the 12th grade, I was fully immersed in the college experience. As time went <coughs> on and as I got older, I began taking more college classes, and the excitement of being in a college classroom was soon accompanied by growing confidence as I felt, as I felt more mature and proud of myself. Proud that I was taken and succeeding in college classes. Proud that I was only a teenager, but accomplishing the goals that are typically set for young adults. There were times along the way that I struggled and became discouraged so much so that I wanted to give up. It was sometimes overwhelming to carry the workload of my high school classes and college classes along with juggling a part-time job as a junior in high school. However, I was always able to rely on the strong support network around me. By the time I reached senior year, I knew that I could turn to any of my classmates who at that point had become more like family. I also always had the support and devotion of my teachers and advisor, who were not only mentors, but were like family to me as well, as were, as were always there encouraging me and pushing me to keep striving for my goals. They always gave up their free time to assist me with anything I might have been struggling with or needed. Around testing times, Saturday school was offered to anyone who needed extra help. Unlike other schools where the student-teacher relationships can be impersonal, KECSS staff made it their personal obligation to see, that, to see that students succeed and felt supported. Their faith in me fueled my self-esteem to not be a quitter. Children like me, those exposed to low-income communities with fewer opportunities than other children, often find giving in and giving up a standard way of life but with the help of my KECSS family, that just wasn't an option for me. After spending seven years at Kingsborough Early College Secondary School, I graduated and was the first person in my family to obtain an associate's degree. I then went on to Brooklyn College and attained a bachelor's degree in childhood education, which felt seamless to me because I was already used to being in a college environment. Now, I'm extremely proud to say that I currently work as a sixth grade math teacher at KECSS. It was because of KECSS, the program, and the staff that I was able to achieve this great success thus far in my life. I will forever be indebted to KECSS, and I am thrilled that I can now help continue a legacy of offering opportunities and college access to other students who face some of the same challenges as I did as a young student. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much to the panel. We're so pleased that um, all of you were able to come and share your information. I was talking with my colleague, and we said that your colleague on your staff <laughs> looks like she could still be a student at this school. <laughs> so we appreciate her coming and sharing her experiences. I have a few questions. Uh, Ms. Conrad, in your testimony, you talked about um, after, on your second page of your testimony, you inserted some data which is not incorporated in the print. 
I mean, you talked about the graduation rate, I think it was, you something about 30%. So if you could give that to me again so I can make accurate notation of what it was you said. Absolutely, and we can also send some information to you after Please. the hearing. So the on-time high school graduation rate across all 17 schools is 92%. Right. Uh, on average, the students earn a 30 credits by the time they graduate, although the diff there's quite a difference. Say again, could you slow down? On average, yes. the graduates earn 30 college credits okay. by the time they graduate from high school, although there's quite an array of uh, performance there. Um, roughly two-thirds of the graduates go on to enroll in four-year colleges and one-third in associate degree programs. Mm -hmm. And our, I know you've asked uh, about college degree completion. Roughly 30% of students who enroll at CUNY have a, earned a college degree within four years of graduating from high school. And another 35% remain enrolled at CUNY at that point in time. So 30% of the ECI graduates enroll and graduate? The enrollment number is much higher. Uh, it's roughly 85% of ECI graduates enroll in college after, within a semester after graduating from their high school program. Mm -hmm. Two thirds of those, high, of those college entrants go to CUNY and of the students at CUNY, two thirds are in a four year program. Do any of those students ever need any remediation? Some need remediation, although the vast majority of students are graduating without the need of remediation. What percentage would you say needs remediation? Uh, just give me a moment and I'll find the number for you. Okay. For uh, let's see, student eighty-two percent of the students are meeting proficiency in English, and seventy-four percent are meeting proficiency in mathematics. So, is that considered the CRI, the College Readiness Index? Would that be what that is? I think. Our colleagues from the Department of Education would have to explain the CRI. That's a measure that they've used. I know it is based on the benchmarks that CUNY sets for college proficiency, right. but I can't comment on how it's actually calculated. So do we know if any of these remedial courses that students have to take are in classes that they have been granted credit for? I, can I just ask a clarifying question? Are you speaking specifically of the courses that the early college students have taken or CUNY in general? Both. <laughs> uh, so the early college students, by and large, do not take remedial courses. Uh, as do you have a percentage? Well, as you heard our colleagues from the Kingsborough School talk about, the high school actually prepares the students for their college credit courses, so the work that I would, might be I, would, a, I would think that if a student were in the ECI program and got college credit for whatever the courses are, they would not be any of those students taking remedial classes. And that's not what I think I'm hearing. You're hearing that roughly 80% don't need any remediation in English right. and roughly 75% don't need any, any remediation in math. So, and that's by the time they finish high school. Right. During their high school program, the high school courses are actually preparing them. So you are correct. In the early college program, they are not taking remedial coursework. Zero. Correct. Okay. That's what I wanted to find out. Okay. Okay. Um, in terms of the testimony that I have, uh, there was a statement that these are dual enrollment programs that students <coughs> are in. So does that mean um, does that mean that if during the course of a day a student has an 
well, when I went to school eons ago, I think we had eight periods. I don't know what it is today. So after a student has been at the DOE curriculum taking eight periods, do they then go for additional time to take classes? And is a class that they take at college substitute for some of the credits that they would need to satisfy with DOE? So you are correct in assuming that um, some courses do substitute for each other. So for example, a student can take freshman English one in 11th grade after they have met the CUNY requirements to sit in that class, which is actually a 75 on the Regents exam. So our students would earn that on the Regents exam and then be allowed to take freshman English one at the campus. That class would dual as credit for towards their associate's degree, but also towards their high school diploma. So 11th grade English would be served by freshman English one. Great. And then do students, you said most of you, you said that, um, oh boy, you had a high percentage of students who graduated with an associate's degree. I did. I was, last year I had 70% of my students. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. And do those students who are in those classes do they, what grade do they start taking advanced classes or college level classes so that they can get 60 credits? Because the other testimony that I had earlier seemed to say that students started taking classes after the 10th grade. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to figure out So how the beauty of the 6 to 12 model is that we have the opportunity to do most of our remediation with our students during the middle school years. Okay. So students, because we are an unscreened program, we can take students who come in reading on a second grade level or reading on a high school level. It is our duty uh, in the middle school to get them ready to start taking college classes as soon as possible. We have sat down with the um, planning committee at Kingsborough, the provost, and um, all of the curriculum people, and they've set up a scope and sequence that works really well for our students. They begin taking classes that are not particularly challenging for them, mm -hmm. and they, it spirals upward. So during the summer, going from eighth grade to ninth grade, they mm -hmm. take their first college class oh. on campus. Um, it's a health course which is offered through the college, but it's only one credit. So the students sit in that class um, after they've been um, remediated by us, so they're ready to take college level coursework, and that starts in eighth grade. Ninth grade, they take one more class, mm -hmm. um, which we've stretched across the entire year because they're still young, okay. and so something that would have taken a typical college student one semester to do, we've done across the entire year. Mm -hmm. um, that's a Spanish class. Um, which our students are prepared for because they take Spanish in our eighth grade year. Um, moving on, then in 10th grade they take four classes and then 11th grade they take, it, it goes higher and higher. And so by the time they go to, to 12th grade, they have earned 60 of the credits. Um, in terms of admission, how are students admitted? Into my school? Yes. It's unscreened. Um, it's strictly by lottery, um, but our school gives preference to districts 20, 21, and 31. So um, roughly like Manhattan Beach, Coney Island, and Staten Island. What is the ethnic composition of districts 20, 21, and 31? It varies because like 21 is Coney Island, um, and then 20 is, but is Manhattan Beach, um, and 31 is Staten Island. How so much preference is given to those districts? No, those are the only districts that our school accepts students from. Oh, you only take yes. students? Oh, oh. Yeah, we only take so students limited. from those yeah, three districts. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Okay. So it's not citywide, it's just no, those? No, it's districts. just those. So you have to live districts. there. Exactly. And because uh, this, this is because we take students in the middle school. So it's right. six, right, we, right. So do you take uh, students into your high school? We open a few seats in ninth grade only because we don't have rolling admission throughout our middle school years. So when we begin um, in ninth grade, in sixth grade with 100 kids, if we lose students due to attrition, then we will fill the seats in the ninth grade year. But typically, that's about 15 seats. So. And then it's citywide. Right. So I, I, the reason that I ask is because I noted in the data that DOE sent us that your school had the highest percentage of uh, white students 
that you had 24% black, 28% Hispanic, and 40% white. So I was wondering mm -hmm. how that came to be. So you're limited. Yes. Uh, to, so it's really not preference, but it's it's the district's. limitations, restrictions. Yes. Okay. I'm may gonna may I add one, one just note there? Um, Tracy said that, but in large measure, uh, the schools that admit students in the sixth grade admit the way middle schools do around the city, and those tend to draw primarily from the geography or the neighborhoods where they're located. So that's a piece of what drives the racial makeup is what communities the schools are located in. And, uh, you know. So it's a reflection of the systemic system that we live in that creates districts that have particular ethnic groups concentrated in those areas. Okay, I'm gonna, I have more questions, but I'm gonna turn it to my co-chair. Thank you very much, um, Chair Barron. Um, let me just say, we, we really like what we're hearing in terms of the programs. Uh, it uh, really seems uh, something that we probably should be doing a lot more of. Um, but I do have some questions as well, and I also appreciate bringing in someone who has been an example of the successful programs, and that, of course, is uh, Ms. Marshall. So, Ms. Marshall, um, do, did you get, did you go on, you went on for your bachelor's degree, did you say at Brooklyn College? Yes. Did you, are you going for a master's degree now? Yes. Well, not currently. Um, the program that I would like to enroll in doesn't take spring admissions, so I'll be enrolling for uh, fall 2018 at Brooklyn. So you will have to eventually go for the master's degree yes. as well. So that's also a, a notable accomplishment, that you're going for the post-secondary, um, uh, post-graduate uh, degree as well. Uh, thank you, and thank you for coming in and sharing that. I was a teacher for 25 years, and Councilmember Barron may even have more time on me than, uh, than I have in the public school system. So may you have as long of a, a career in your, in your school as well. Thank you. Sure. Um, and then for Ms. Amurin, um, I noticed that you said that uh, in your uh, graduation rate, you had 96% graduation rate and 70% of your graduates earning a full associate's degree. That's within the four year, uh, within the six year period that you have? They don't, they don't go, in, they don't stay with you until 14, right? They do not. So this is within the time that they're with us, including the summer after they graduate. Some students take classes that summer, but after that. So they're leaving all of them, 70% of them are leaving with the associate's degree. That is correct. Okay, thank you. And then for um, uh, Ms. Conrad, uh, a question as well. Um, in your testimony, you said that roughly 16% of the graduates, um, it's on the second page, it's a little unclear to me, so let me just read the paragraph. Because the ECI schools work with both community colleges and senior colleges, students from about half of the schools have the opportunity to earn an associate degree, degree by the time they graduate. So that's half of the 17 schools? Yes, that's right. The other half of the schools are partnered with a CUNY four-year college, and the four-year colleges don't have the opportunity to grant associate degrees. So in those cases, students are earning up to 60 credits, which would be a, a, the equivalent of the first two years of a bachelor's degree. So of those students who were in the four-year, who were so affiliated with the four-year colleges, do you know how many, per, or what percentage would go on to continue to get the four-year degree? We have over 80% of our students who are enrolling in college immediately thereafter, and I think that's relatively that, that's consistent across the two-year, the both groups. What was that percentage again? It's over 80, it, I'll give you the exact number, just a minute. Yeah. It's roughly 84% of the students go on to college immediately after they've graduated from an early college school. Okay, so in your testimony also you said in 2016 roughly 16% of the graduates from those schools did just that. That's where I was unclear. They did, what did they do? Did they, they, they got the associate's degree? That's correct. So that was in the half of the schools that participate. That's correct. Okay, so that seems a little low to me compared to Kingsborough. Can you describe what's happening, what's the difference between the colleges? Absolutely. Um, that 
there, there's within the group of schools that have the potential to grant an associate degree by the end of 12th grade, there's a couple of different models. Um, we talked earlier, or the, in the DOE panel earlier, we mentioned the uh, middle college high school at LaGuardia and international high school at LaGuardia, um, which were longstanding schools and be became early college schools. Those students are earning college credits, but they're less focused on the associate degree. So the 16% takes into account those two schools, even though there's less of an immediate focus on, on students earning the associate degree. It still seems to me, though, that that is a number we'd like to see improve. I completely agree. So uh, what are we doing to make that happen? Uh, so we continue to work with schools like Kingsboro, and they have uh, an exemplary associate degree rate, we believe, at this point in time. Hostos Lincoln Academy has actually increased its associate degree granting rate as well over the last several years. Um, so we are taking best practices. We actually have the schools come together and talk with each other about the best practices that they use in order to get to uh, degree completion rates. So how many students um, system-wide earn an AA degree uh, while still in high school? We can get you that number. I don't think I have it right here at the moment. Okay, and then um, you mentioned in your testimony also, you said in 2016, roughly 16% of the graduates. Do you have figures for 14 and 15? Sure, we'll get those to you after today. Okay, do you, but off the top of the head, of your head, would you know if they're higher or lower than the 16 percent? My sense is it's roughly comparable, but I'll have to get you the data. Okay. Councilman Drum, could I just add one yes. point on that, which is the question of, of increasing the, the number of students who ultimately graduate, whether it's while they're at the high school or beyond. As we expand ASAP to 25,000 students, and particularly the students who have the lowest number of credits accumulated while in high school, we are pretty convinced by the evidence that the number of students will dramatically increase because of what is going on in, 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 at ASAP and with the uh, dramatic expansion. So I'm relatively optimistic that that figure uh, will, will change a whole lot in the next couple of years. Uh, it may not mirror what Kingsboro is doing. Uh, clearly, they are a star school, but I, I am pretty confident that, that, that progress will continue to be made. And so the other programs that you mentioned in your testimony as well, they're contributing to that, you, what you hope to see? Um, just I believe that is true as well. The Explorers, I, I, for example. Yeah, too early to have any real significant results on what Explorers is, is going to mean, other than exposing lots of, of, of students uh, to, to what college is, is about. Uh, the LINK program as well, which is expanding, uh, and clearly College Now, which enables students to, to have credits. And this is, again, all of these are far beyond the early college high schools. Uh, you know, we're, we're involved in, I think, over 400 high schools, as we said. I'm just interested in that and, and questioning that because the council spends a lot of money on um, uh, high school dropout prevention, which I think is very important. But oftentimes part of that is also visits to college campuses, which I think is very beneficial to do. Um, and, uh, and so that's why I was interested in that as well. Now, do the students who are enrolled at ECI schools um, have access to the partnered college campuses, can they just go or do, can they share in programs, student benefits, etc.? Yes, the students participate in a variety of activities on the college campus. Each college partnership is slightly different, but students can participate in clubs. Um, the students at KECSS become part of the Honor Society at Kingsboro if they meet those criteria the students really do become integrated fully into the life of the college as they mature in their program. Do you offer any type of um, SAT prep? Some of the schools do uh, create SAT prep opportunities for their students, yes. With the cross enrollment, do they need the SAT prep? Given that 
the majority of the students who are graduating from the early college schools are, are entering CUNY as transfer students. In large measure, the SAT is not necessary. Sometimes it's beneficial to them. Um, and how are children, um, how are students uh, tracked after graduation? Do you have any system uh, for that? Yes, the students who are alumni from the early college high schools have a code in the CUNY system that notes that they're an alumni of an early college school. So they are, they're identifiable across the CUNY data system. Um, do you have uh, any, any information on what that looks like? We what do, are they doing? We do. The students, I mean, as we talked earlier, they're earning college credits at a faster rate than their peers. They're staying enrolled longer and persisting to degrees faster um, than similarly prepared students from other schools. And job-wise? We don't have data on how they do once they graduate from college. What percentage of, stu of students uh, go on to enroll at community colleges? At CUNY or community college? Sure. So roughly well, let me give you this. So, of the students who graduate, roughly 60% of them come to CUNY, and of that 60%, roughly two-thirds are in four-year colleges and one-third are in community colleges. Okay, I think that's it for me. Council Member? Thank you, Mr. Chair. A few more questions. So, Ms. Conrad, you said that uh, students amass credits, but they don't necessarily have an associate's degree, they don't have enough credits for associates. How many of those students who have amassed some credits go on to either a two or four year institution? The vast majority of students who've graduated from an early college school have credits. Uh, right. I believe it's over 90% graduate with at least six credits. Okay. So then I gave you the statistics earlier, about 84% of them are going to college, 60% of that group are at CUNY, two-thirds are in a four-year college, one-third are in a community college. Okay. In terms of uh, pay, finance, fiscal issues. What does it cost CUNY for this partnership? We seem to be able to, we don't seem to be able to get that dollar amount. And I'm sure that- I think we're gonna give you some uh, estimate figures right now, if you would. Okay. Yes. Do you have any idea of what it costs in terms of providing for the textbooks for these students? So, as our colleagues from the DOE uh, mentioned in their panel, we do share the costs of this program with them. Is it 50-50? It is 50-50 include after taking into account some contributions from the state. At full capacity for a school that has roughly 110 students per grade level, once the school is in its full capacity, that school requires between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars a year to cover the college expenses for the school. Ah, finally. Uh, yes. The number we can start with. Good. Okay. Um, I did have another question. Oh, yes. Uh, to our panelists, I've, your name again? Liara Marshall. Okay. Yes, why did you decide to go to Brooklyn when the school that you were partnering with was not Brooklyn? Why did you decide to go to Brooklyn College and did you have any problems with your credits being accepted at Brooklyn? No, um, I didn't go, well I graduated my associate's degree so I was already done with Kingsboro. Um, so I went on to Brooklyn rather oh, than- Oh right, Kingsboro, two year college, <laughs> okay. Um, no, I didn't yeah. have any problems transferring my credits. I started as a junior. You started as a junior, yes. okay, right, because you were graduated already. You had your associate's degree. No problem, so it just was seamless with that. Yep. Okay. Um, so where do most of your students go? Are there particular four-year schools? Do you find a concentration 
of particular schools where your graduates go? Yes. Those so, that have their associates? Yes. Um, most of my students who stay in the CUNY system uh -huh. um, tend to go to Brooklyn uh, because of proximity to right. their homes. They're all South, either South Brooklyn or Staten Island students. Do you have any percentage of students who go to other schools outside of CUNY? Do you have a, a statistic for how many students don't go to CUNY but go elsewhere? So um, last year we graduated uh, 80 students. Um, about 60% of them went on to, I'm sorry, about 60 of the 80 students went on to CUNY schools. And do you know where the others went? Do we keep that data? They went to SUNY schools, um, and about eight of them um, didn't enroll in college right away. Um, I have three kids who went into the military and some students who went into trade programs, but that's it. Uh, well, I, I commend you uh, for the work that you're doing. And thank you. First of all, being a principal is challenging, and to get those <laughs> kinds of results is fantastic. So I do commend you. and. The results, you know, the proof is in the students that come back and are able to even come back and be an instructor where they were at high school. So that's really great. I commend you. Thank you. Okay, we want to thank you so much for thank coming and participating. Much. We do ask that you get back to us with the questions that we asked. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now we'd like to call up the representatives from Bard High School, Michael Lerner, the principal. Haja Diallo, a student, and Stephen Termain um, from Bard Early College High School as well. So I'd like to swear you in if you just raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Who would like to start? I'll begin. Go thank right you, ahead. council, yep. for the opportunity to submit testimony, and thank you for your interest in early college in New York City. My name is Stephen Tremaine. I'm Bard College's vice president for early colleges. Bard is a nonprofit independent college of the liberal arts and sciences in Annandale, New York about two hours upstate. Bard is distinguished uh, by a set of initiatives that extend opportunities in the liberal arts and sciences without compromise to the corners of American life in which those opportunities are often least accessible. In this spirit, Bard runs three signature programs, the nation's largest college and prisons program, a national network of tuition-free Bard courses for the working poor, and a national network of tuition-free early colleges run in partnership with public school systems. The Bard Early Colleges Network started in New York City in 2001 at the invitation of then Chancellor Harold Levy. It wasn't an accident that Chancellor Levy invited Bard. Since 1979, Bard has led the nation's first early college, Simons Rock, a residential college for high school age students located in Western Massachusetts. Bard brings over 35 years of experience and expertise in early college to its partnership with the DOE. The Bard High School Early College model enables students to earn 60 transferable college credits and a Bard Associate's degree at no cost to students alongside a state high school diploma. It's a simple idea. To make the transition to college as seamless as possible, we provide the first two years of college during the four years of high school under the same roof and with the same community. Students graduate two years ahead of the game and they stay ahead of the game. BSEC, Bard High School Early College, graduates are better prepared for four-year degrees, more likely to finish, and vastly better positioned to afford a high-quality BA with little or no debt. The results are powerful. In the most recent graduating class, 92% of students earned the Associate in Arts degree at BSEC, and among those who did not complete the degree, the average number of transferable credits earned was 50. Over 95% go on to enroll in four-year colleges, and over 70% do so here in New York, popular schools, primarily including the Sunnis. From the classes of 06 to 09, 94% of students have completed a BA in four years or less, compared to a national average of 59% in six years or less. A matched pair analysis recently completed by Metis Associates shows that 
alongside matched comparable groups from traditional and selective New York high schools, there was a significant increase in BA attainment through BSEC. It was most marked, we found, for boys who were 40% more likely to finish a BA coming through the BARD program than a traditional high school model. Last year, over 6,000 students applied for the roughly 300 open seats at our two New York schools. In the face of this extraordinary demand from families across New York, we are working strategically to make BSEC accessible to ambitious young people of all backgrounds. Of our 1,200 students in the city, 12% are African American, 18% Hispanic, 31% Asian and Pacific Islander, and 37% white. While we don't yet have all free and reduced price lunch forms for this year, the student body was 36% free and reduced lunch last year. 42% of last year's incoming class were recruited from high needs middle schools. We're implementing a special education program which began last school year, through which the ninth grade is nearly 8% and the student body will be nearly doubling in special education in the coming year. Additionally, we're excited to be working with the New York DOE's diversity in admissions pilot, which we've applied to be a part of, which would allow for an admissions process that would ensure that at least 63% of seats at our Queens campus went to students from low-income families. To sustain the excellent early colleges already in place and to work to meet the demand from families across New York, we are hoping to work with the city to address key structural challenges. The most significant of these is financial. Bard's early colleges in New York face a structural funding gap equivalent to $3,000 per student per year. These funds, over and above the per-pupil funding provided by the DOE, are needed for three areas that are essential to the early college model. Student supports to help young people through a uniquely rigorous program, outreach and admission staff to recruit student bodies that are eager for early college and representative of the diversity of New York, and collegiate textbooks and academic resources. Currently, the schools are dependent on philanthropy to close this gap. BART has taken responsibility for raising these funds and has invested them fully back in the BSEX. Since 2001 in New York City alone, that investment has totaled more than $40 million. This funding gap leaves a vibrant and highly successful path to college with an uncertain future. If this gap is addressed, early college can and will grow ambitiously across New York City, enabling thousands more families to earn a free, high-quality two-year degree through the DOE and partners like BARD. This is an investment that we know is well-placed. Early college graduates finish college in far higher rates and at far lower total cost to government and to themselves and their families. New York City took the lead in launching the public early college movement, and we ask that the city's leadership continue in finding a lasting funding solution for this work. Thank you for your consideration. And I'm happy to introduce my colleague, Michael Lerner, principal of the Bard High School Early College in Manhattan. Good afternoon. Thank you to the chairs for the opportunity to submit testimony today. My name is Michael Lerner, and I am the principal of Bard High School Early College in Manhattan. I began teaching history at the school in 2002 and took over as principal in 2010. In addition to serving as principal, I continue to teach classes in history and serve as a student advisor in our advisory program. I feel very fortunate to be leading this partnership between the Department of Education and Bard College. There are 590 students currently enrolled at the BSEC Manhattan campus, which is located on the Lower East Side. Another 600 are enrolled at our sister campus in Queens. The simplest way to explain our program is that students do two years of high school coursework in ninth and 10th grade, followed by two years of college coursework in what would normally be the last two years of high school. BSEC students complete five New York State Regents exams by the end of 10th grade and spend the last two years enrolled exclusively in college-level classes. At the end of four years, BSEC students earn both a Regents diploma and an associate's degree from Bard College. BSEC students typically earn 60 or more college credits, all tuition-free, which are transferable to public and private colleges. The ability of BSEC students to earn and transfer college credits makes college more affordable and more accessible to hundreds of New York City families every year. The student experience at BSEC is anchored in a traditional liberal arts curriculum. The ninth grade and 10th grade program emphasizes giving students the foundations and teaching them the academic skills to succeed in college. Classes emphasize argumentative and analytical writing, hands-on work in science labs, problem solving, discussion, critical thinking, 
and collaborative work. In addition to all the core disciplines, students study Mandarin, Latin, or Spanish, participate in the arts, and take part in a wide range of extracurricular activities, including clubs, athletics, internships, and volunteer work in the community. The BSEC college program resembles what any student might encounter in the first two years at a small liberal arts college, except that it is in a high school setting. At the core of the curriculum is an interdisciplinary humanities seminar modeled on what is offered at Bard College. Over the course of two years, all students read and discuss classic texts in history, philosophy, and literature from the ancient to modern era. Students write extensively and complete the course with an individual research project of their own design. In addition to the seminar sequence, all students in the college program take college biology, a seminar in mathematical thought, and choose an array of electives to complete the requirements for the associate's degree. Both the high school classes and college classes at BSEC are offered in the same building by the same faculty. Students do not travel off-site to take college classes, and they work with the same teachers over four years. This adds an additional measure of support as students take on the challenge of college work. Classes are small, generally 20 to 24 students, and a range of academic supports are available to all students. BSEC faculty tend to come from college teaching backgrounds. Our program requires teachers have their credentials and experience to teach college classes. They must also know how to teach and support younger students in the ninth and 10th grade. Since opening in 2001, BSEC has attracted a diverse student body from all five boroughs of the city. Some students may commute three hours a day to take advantage of the opportunity to earn college credits. The current demographic breakdown of the school is 70% Hispanic, 26% Asian, 14% African American, and 40% white, 1% multiracial. Last year, 45% of the student body was eligible for free or reduced lunch. About 6% of students received special education services, and that number is growing as we expand our special education program. As a screened school, we receive approximately 3,000 applications a year at each campus for admission into ninth grade. We typically have 100 to 150 to 170 seats available. We rank students for admission by a combination of a writing assessment, a math assessment, and an interview. We do not strictly rank students by performance, but review each applicant holistically. The diversity of BSEC is fostered by an extensive outreach program facilitated by a New York State Smart Scholars Grant. The funds from the grant have allowed us to reach out to underserved middle schools throughout the city to recruit students who may be interested in early college. In recent years, nearly a third of our incoming class has come through the Smart Scholars Outreach. In the past four years, BSEC has consistently graduated 97 to 100 percent of each cohort, and all but a handful of students earn the associate's degree. Those who fall short of AA requirements still graduate with upwards of 55 college credits. Just as important, DOE metrics show that 94 to 99 percent of Bard students have met the city's college readiness criteria, and 99 percent of students persist in college beyond 18 months. By any measure, the partnership between DOE and Bard College has been very successful. 16 years after the founding of BSEC Manhattan, over 2,500 students have received free college degrees as a result of this opportunity, giving these students the preparation necessary and a clear path to a bachelor's degree. Thank you for the opportunity to present this overview of the Bard Early College Program in New York City. I'd like to introduce one of my students, Haja Diallo. Hello, my name is Haja Diallo, and I am a senior at Bard High School Early College, Manhattan campus. The first time I'd heard of Bard High School was in seventh grade when there was word going around the school about Bard administrating the admissions test at our school. Soon the high school fair took place where I met a Bard representative who spoke to me about Bard's unique curriculum. The same day I went home and told my mother about Bard and her interest in what I was saying did not spike until she heard me utter the word college. To my mother, the, wor the word college holds a promise and a future that she did not have, but has worked hard for her kids to one day experience. With that one word, my mother and I visited Bard's information session, where we met with upperclassmen and spoke with them about their experience at Bard and how Bard has shaped them. Despite my mother not wanting me to leave the Bronx for high school, she highly encouraged me to endure the 75 minutes of travel to Bard every day for the next four years. What seemed to be the worst day of my life at the time dawned on me the day that I was not accepted to Bard High School. My freshman year of high school was spent at another high school in the Bronx. In the beginning of the year, my principal and guidance counselor encouraged me to reapply to Bard, 
because they believed that they could not offer me the most rigorous coursework or assistance that I could receive elsewhere. At the time, I was taking geometry with sophomores and chemistry with seniors and juniors. After reapplying to Bard, I transferred in 10th grade. The transition was rough at first as I had to readjust to a new setting, a new style of learning, and rigorous coursework. It was easy for me to make friends because the students at Bard are genuinely open to talking to and meeting new people. At Bard, learning from one's peers and engaging in seminar-style discussions where students are prompted to think are both valued. I was nervous at first to speak up in class until I realized that I learned best when engaging and putting forth my ideas. The hardest part was adjusting to the coursework. I was not used to receiving multiple essays, readings, and daily homework. At first it was hard, but I worked closely with my guidance counselor to learn how to balance this new workload. She encouraged me to go to office hours, which all teachers at Bard have. My two biggest resources my first year at Bard, which remain the same today, are office hours and the writing center. For every paper I have, I meet with my professor to talk about my thesis, and then I go to the writing center to polish my essay. My transition into the college program was at first daunting, but also rewarding. The workload became heavier and expectations grew, but the guidance was still there for those who needed it. The most rewarding aspect comes from the ability to choose my own classes. While there is rigor, there is also engagement as I am able to craft what I want to learn more about. For instance, after taking Introduction to College Bi Biology, I am currently doing an independent study with my professor on the effectiveness of DNA barcoding as opposed to taxonomic classifications for classifying soil invertebrates. I would like to reemphasize re the unique guidance at Bard. There are multiple counselors at Bard who are there and willing to help. I often find myself going back and forth between three different counselors for different expertise. As of now, the most rewarding help that I and my peers receive are guidance from the college office. The graduating class is broken up into different cohorts of 20 students who work one-on-one -on -one with a college admissions, with a college counselor on applying to college. This help, this help begins as early as our first year in the college program. For example, I began writing drafts of my college essay several months ago with the help of my college counselor. In college advisory, we were encouraged to find programs unique to our interests to explore over the summer. With the help of my outside program and BARD, I took a course at Northwestern University over the summer and with the help of Dr. Lerner attended ACLU's Summer Institute as well. My experience as B at BARD has served as a beacon of light that will help me further discover my interest in college. Thank you to the panel for coming and for sharing. I did have an opportunity as did the co-chair here for this hearing, to visit BARD, and I was very impressed. It is, in fact, that seminar uh, format that's used and engages students and gets them to contribute and to share their ideas, so I commend you on what you're doing. And um, to Ms. Diallo, just a quick question. So if you, spe from what I understand at BARD, for four years of high school is consolidated into two, and then the last two years of high school uh, are in fact college courses. So if you came in as a transfer student, how did you work to get all of those three years consolidated into one? Um, so for a lot of the transfers, we typically come in having taken similar courses that the freshmen at Bard would have taken. The only difference would be if we didn't take the five regions that are necessary. So coming into Bard, um, my schedule was completely the same as everyone else. I took my global history course with the regents. I also took a world literature class to take my English regents. Mm -hmm. And um, I took physics instead of chemistry. So Phys in ninth grade at Bard, students take physics and 10th grade they take chemistry but because I had taken chemistry freshman year I just took the freshman course to fulfill that requirement so I don't think your your, your course your course load wouldn't be packed to fulfill other requirements because the school makes sure that the students coming in have certain prerequisites already 
And did you find that the coursework that you did at your first year in high school uh, was on par with what you got at Bard, if you were to make a comparison? I won't ask you to name them, but did you find that it was as academically sound? Um, yeah, I think the work at Bard, okay. the only difference is the rigor of the work and the amount of work that you're given. Mm -hmm. But I think that at first it was overwhelming, but at Bard there's good guidance for um, transfer students. So we meet with our counselors and they give us advice on how to deal with that. And a lot of the times you should just meet with your teachers during office hours. But I think the academic rigor definitely increased and the amount of work that you're expected increases. I think to help you transition into the college program more effectively. Thank you. Um, I, I'm very, you know, pleased to know that Bard has a vision for understanding that it has some social responsibility and that you offer college courses in prison, which is commendable because we know that if we have people who are incarcerated who don't expand what their world is and what their opportunity is, there's a higher rate of recidivism. And of course, the tuition-free courses that you offer to the poor, so I commend you on that. In your testimony, uh, on the second page, uh, second paragraph, oh, um, Mr. Tremaine, uh, you talk about the funding need. Uh, Bard's early colleges face a structural funding gap equivalent to $3,000 per student. Uh, these funds over and above the per pupil funding provided by the DOE are needed for three areas of the college model. Student supports to help young people through a uniquely rigorous program, which is a question that I had asked earlier. Um, outreach and admission staff to recruit st student bodies uh, that are eager for college, early college, and representative of the diversity of the city and collegiate textbooks and academic resources, which is another question I asked. So previous testimony said that DOE pays half and um, CUNY pays half. So can you explain why there's this need for collegiate textbooks above and beyond what CUNY and DOE say they provide? And can you explain how you're working to increase uh, the numbers of students who are black and Latino? because I think it's only 12% that you have that are black in, and 18% Hispanic. So those two points, and just expound on the financial needs. Thank you, council member. And I'll address the financials and ask my colleague to speak to the second part of your question. Uh, the Bard campuses in New York City receive the per student funding comparable to other New York City high schools, as well as an additional weight for specialized academic programs. It's beyond that that we raise under a business model that's probably different than the CUNY ECI programs, $3,000 per student per year. Uh, we're pleased that the DOE has worked with us on some ideas about addressing that gap, uh, and we're excited to do it. Um, but that $3,000 as a composite figure encompasses not only textbooks, but also, a number of the supports that Ms. Diallo mentioned, like a writing center, uh, like guidance resources, those supports that you have the responsibility to provide a young person in their first years on a four-year campus, we provide under the roof of the early college campus. Uh, currently, that's at a cost to Bard College. So I just want to be clear, the $3,000 is for additional textbooks that students need that DOE and uh, CUNY don't provide for? So uh, let me give a, a more concrete example. Um, our DOE allocation for textbooks every year is, is for this year is just over $30,000. We typically spend upwards of $100,000 a year on textbooks. So BARD and uh, additional help from our PTA make up the difference. Uh, college textbooks tend to cost more. They're not always available through the DOE purchasing uh, pipeline, so we really do rely on Bard College to supplement uh, the DOE funding in that regard. Okay, and the other parts of the question about the outreach and uh, student supports, we well, did talk about student supports, 
but about outreach? The outreach has been a major focus of ours for the last 10 years or so. Um, the Smart Scholars Grant that we get from New York State is critical for that. What we found, and if you compare our numbers now to what they were, say, 10 years ago, you will see a, a, a great shift. Um, it is very difficult in, in New York City to get a diverse student body into any school. I mean, a lot of the way the system works makes it harder to do that. Uh, we're not able to consider things like lunch status or ethnicity in, in, in admissions, obviously. So we do have to do a great deal of outreach to make sure that families are aware of the opportunity of BARD. We do send students and uh, outreach staff out to schools all over the city. Um, they often go and actually give the test at the school that we're visiting. All of that, we hope, from year to year, yields a more diverse uh, student body. Uh, some years are better than other. It is always an uphill battle. If we left things alone and did not do that additional outreach, the numbers would be, would be far less diverse than they are. So you go to the schools and administer the tests at the schools? Is we there do. a pool of schools that you've targeted, or how does a school get to be uh, included or considered? Through the Smart Scholars uh, Grant defines a certain pool of schools as underserved middle schools, and we do go to those schools to administer the test there. Are those schools located in all of the boroughs? All five boroughs, yes. All five boroughs. If, if you could get us that list, I'd like to see sure. what that list is. Um, I would just add, Council Member, that uh, we've refined the list largely through a study conducted by the Annenberg Institute for School Reform called Is Demography Destiny? that identifies the 17 zip codes within New York City uh, in which students face the largest systemic obstacles to higher education degree completement. And we reach out strategically to the middle schools in those neighborhoods. Okay, so it's 17 particular zip codes that you pull your students from. Not exclusively, but with the greatest emphasis. That's the greatest. Okay, if you could get that list, I'd love to see it. I wanna see if my district uh, zip codes are in there. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Barron, as well. Um, I have visited uh, Bard uh, Queens and was very impressed with the uh, level and quality of teaching, and I do agree that the students were tremendously engaged in their work. I um, observed a lesson that was being taught by a teacher on the new Jim Crow and on mass incarceration, which uh, was um, very engaging for the students. Um, and um, it, it's in line, I guess, with the work for the incarcerated as well, which I think probably happens mostly upstate in the Poughkeepsie, Rhinebeck area, um, near the, the main campus. Uh, and I can I congratulate you and applaud you on that. Um, one question that comes to mind, uh, you know, I, next week we're having a hearing on bullying and the effectiveness of the DOE's programs in bullying. I would imagine that that might be an issue in Bard or any of the high schools that we've been talking about today as well. And so I'm just wondering if you would know, do any of your, do either of the schools, either of the campuses have a Gay Straight Alliance, a GSA? Um, how have you addressed that issue on your campuses? Both schools have, have GSAs um, and other clubs, I mean, a number of student organizations. Um, I think, I mean, Haja, if you want to speak to the, the climate of the school, but I'll say that while bullying is a concern in any school, I would think that the, the expectations of students in the early college programs tend to set the tone uh, in a little different way, and so often these problems are not as severe in early colleges as they are in traditional high schools. Yeah, I think that at Bard there's not a huge or even a culture of bullying at our school. I think that students there genuinely get along and I, I don't see any cases of that. And I think in terms of clubs, there are um, many clubs that are inclusive. So um, um, especially through the diversity initiative. So a lot of times we have um, BSA and this year we just opened up a new club called ASO, African Student Organization. We have LASSO and we've, this year we also have a new club, the Jewish, Jewish Student Alliance. And I think that each club makes it a point to have as many students in their club as possible, especially through the incoming freshman class to help them find their place at Bard. So I guess with that level of respect among students, you don't need metal detectors. No, my old school had metal detectors, but your old school did. Yeah, Bard doesn't have. Oh, that. interesting. What was that like? Um, I had to 
get to school about 40 minutes early because there were about, I think, 8,000 kids in the building, so. Yeah. How did that affect the environment of the school? Um, did that have any impact on why you wanted to go to Bard? Um, no, I had my mindset on Bard since seventh grade, um, and I think my main focus point was on the academics. Um, I think that all schools, you can go to a school and make the best out of it. It just depends on the rigor of the courses. And so I think that's what my main focus was. It must have been a very liberating experience to go from a school that has metal detectors, allegedly because of uh, incidents of um, violence or bullying in the school, to a school uh, as esteemed as Bard. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think that probably had a tremendous impact on many of the choices that you've made since then yeah. and will make in the future as well. Let me just go back a little bit to the LGBT issue because um, Councilmember Barron covered a lot of what I was going to ask before. Um, but do you do any data collection on LGBT students? I mean, we, we do data collection on everything, <laughs> but yes, we do. Um, I mean, it, it's something we, we've really prided ourselves at BARD as being a safe and inclusive community for all students. So uh, issues around transgender students, uh, gay students, uh, making sure that they have supports. I mean, the faculty are very involved. It's something that's a, a big part of the discussions at the school. So you said you do do, you do, do data collection? Again, we're collecting data on everything. Um, do you have any specific data in mind that you're, well, you're No, I, I, we recently passed legislation here in the council uh, that's going to require the Department of Education to do uh, data collection for LGBT, I, and A students and uh, other descriptions is however they want to use it. And um, I really believe a lot in that data collection. It's voluntary, um, but it would be for every student who's above the age of 14 years old to complete uh, because there's very little data on uh, LGBT students, and I think one of the things that I did learn on my trip to Bard was the, uh, the pro, uh, the positive uh, treatment of LGBT students in your schools. Yes. And so that's why I kind of wanted to ask these questions. So, okay. But um, if you're not already collecting specific data in those categories, I would love to have a discussion with you further on about how we could do that. Certainly. Yep. Okay. And then um, just to go back to the money, because I know that that's been an issue that um, has been brought to my attention. Um, how many students do you have, New York City Public School students, in the two campuses? Uh, it's just over 1,200, roughly 600 at each school. S 680? 600 at each school. 600 at each school. 1,200 students times $3,000? That's that right. that make up the difference? Yeah. Who's good at math? <laughs> What would be the, the total cost of that? The total gap that we face in New York City, all combined, is $3.9 million per year. $3.9 million? Towards that amount, uh, the New York City DOE makes a contribution that's noted in your briefing uh, of $895,000 every year. Uh, and the remaining $3 million every year uh, is through the college's fundraising efforts. So I think when Queens, when Kingsborough was talking about resources, there was a figure of about three hundred thousand dollars used, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Um, how does that differ with Bard? Is is part of the reason for the cost because you're a private institution? Yeah, that is part of the reason. Frankly, there's a structural distinction whereby the college, as a private institution in New York State, is not eligible to receive base aid, which is a per student funding source uh, through Albany. Um, that we do not see, that I believe the uh, ECI schools do. Um, and you could look at that as roughly equivalent uh, to our fundraising need. So it's an interesting relationship then. You're working with New York City school students who are technically eligible for public school aid, but not necessarily because you're a private institution. Precisely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. So I, I look forward to continuing to have that discussion with you on the 3.9 million uh, and what we can do to fill that gap as well. Terrific. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, I have uh, just one or two other questions. What are the qualifications of your staff, your faculty? We generally are looking for people who have the credentials uh, to teach college classes. So often that's a PhD in their field or a terminal degree in their field. 
uh, some college teaching experience. Um, I mean, that's generally what we're looking for, and that is a very different profile than the typical New York City DOE teacher. And what is the number of faculty that you have for the 600 students in each of those campuses? We have 48 faculty in Manhattan, and the number in Queens is similar. And what's the average class size? 20 to 24 students. What's the average class size? <laughs> 20 to 24 students, 20 to 24 <laughs> students, which is by, I mean, you know, part of the thinking behind this is, I mean, if you visit either of the Bard campuses, you'll right. see we run a pretty tight ship in terms of money. There's not a lot of money to go around because we're putting it all into faculty. And part of our belief ah. is that if you're going to ask students to do college work at the age of 15 or 16, you have to give them smaller classes and you have to give them support. So that's why we really do prioritize the class sizes that we have. That's what you mean. Yes, that, because you've got to have the instructors reading and grading and interacting with the students on their writing. It's not just to give them a grade and you give it back to them. You've got to counsel with them. And so it really is that intense. And yeah, it is a, it's a different kind of, of teaching. It's exactly. a different, different demand on the instructor. Exactly. Okay. And uh, did I have a Oh, yes. What about your uh, ELL learners? Do you have a percentage of that? I saw black, Latino, and Asian. As you pointed out earlier, the number of ELL students uh, is very low. I um, mean, I will tell you right now we have only one student at the Manhattan School who is an active ELL student receiving services. However, 36% uh, of the students are former ELL students. So they still uh, need and receive additional support. Um, I mean, that one ELL student who we have, based on her, so she'll probably test out this year. Um, and so we don't typically get a lot of students uh, who are ELLs. Um, I mean, that's part of the nature of a screen program, for better or worse. Um, but we do see students who are coming with any uh, ELL issues, and that is part of the support services we address. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I in terms of uh, the faculty that you have, you, you have high standards, which is commendable, and you indicate that uh, they, the salary that they are paid uh, reflects the fact that they're, what is their salary range? Well, if you're familiar with the DOE budgeting process, there's an average salary for the building. Uh, so the average salary for DOE faculty in the building this year is uh, roughly $84,000. They tend to be on the higher end of the UFT scale because they have the advanced degrees. And we also have a pretty uh, good track record in terms of retaining faculty, so they tend to be people who've been at the school for, say, 10 years or longer. And what's the ethnic breakdown, breakdown of your faculty? Um, I just did some quick numbers while, while we were hearing from the other panels. Uh, of the 48 uh, faculty members, uh, my count is 14 are faculty of color. Okay. And do you have a breakdown, black, Latino? Uh, five African-American, uh, four Hispanic, five Asian. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you so much for coming and providing testimony. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to that panel. Our next panel uh, will be Sterling Robeson from the uh, UFT, Vice President, Michael Whitshire, from Megger Evers, Megger Evers College Prep, uh, Caramon Carty from Monroe College. Okay, I'd like to swear you in. If you would just raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Okay, Mr. Robeson, would you like to start? Sure. 
Well, uh, let me just uh, say thank you uh, for being here. My name is Sterling Robeson, Vice President for Career and Technical Education for the United Federation of Teachers. And just to say uh, to the chairs, uh, and as Baron and Danny Drum, on behalf of the 200,000 members we represent in terms of our, our members, uh, it's great to be here in terms of dealing with this important matter with regards to uh, the impact on what we're talking about, about high school is um, earning an associate's degree. So we heard a lot of testimony today. Uh, I'm not going to read my testimony as shared for distribution. Um, I'll just deal with the, um, the various aspects of my testimony. But um, we've heard a lot of data in terms of um, the importance and the statistical data as it relates to the number of students, the various programs, the number of uh, programs. So I'm going to be a little bit more practical in terms of, um, and right to the point about what is this all about. Um, we're going to break it up in categories. What's at stake? Um, what does it mean in, as it relates to the associate degree? And how does it provide dividends for many of our students, which was uh, discussed? Um, the strength of the PTEC model. Um, we're very familiar with that model and support it. Um, how do we build on college now, other um, readiness programs, and the UFT overall support of higher education and career pre pre preparedness? And obviously, at the end of the day, how do we ensure that we have lifelong learners? Well, first of all, when we think about what's at stake, it's real um, simple. We know that the changes um, educationally and around the world, we are living in a global um, knowledge economy, which means that we have to prepare our young people um, for that change. And when we think about it, um, we talked about the, redu the reduction of remediation, um, many of those things. But at the end of the day, what does that really mean when we overarchingly talk about an education, whether it's post-secondary or in a K-12 space? How do you ensure that students have the 21st century skills they need to be successful in college or career? What does that mean? How do they collaborate? How do they communicate? How do they have the critical thinking that they need, as well as the creativity and innovation? What does that really mean with respect to what we need to do to provide students and, and all young people with the competencies that they need um, in our area of career and technical education is the combination of the skill set as well as the academics, ultimately um, dealing with literacy and how do we quantify that through credentialing. In this case, we're talking about the associate's degree and earning that at, at the high school level. Um, with that being said, um, what do we need to do to um, sort of change what we do educationally to meet that challenge and the demands um, today? So when we think about um, what the 9 through 14 model, um, well, first let's talk about um, also why it's important in terms of um, the conversation that we're having today. Number one, um, how do we ensure that ec students in economically disadvantaged have the same equity and access that they need to um, a variety of programs? Number two, how do we also, with the understanding that um, the cost, when it comes to the rising cost of higher education, how do we make sure that these um, students actually are able to um, afford to go to college? There's one thing about access, and you can have access, but then if you can't afford it, then you're, you're back to square one. But the reason why the 9 through 14 model is appealing to us and why we, we like this model is because students are gaining a number of things. Number one, um, it's a cost savings um, when it comes to the time in high school, as well as we talked about the cost sharing, um, but at the end of the day, students have a proven track record of mastery. Number one, they get their academics, they get their Regents Diploma. Number two, from the career and technical education side, the industry authentic, the authentic, Authenticity as it relates to gaining a credential, meaning an industry credential, as well as an associate degree, it is very important. And when we think about the models, although it was not really talked about today, it's not just the idea that it's a 9 to 14 model that the students are getting an associate degree. Many of those schools are career pathways. It's not by happenstance. There's a business, um, is a BTEC, the business of technology, early college. There's an engineering and architecture. There's an energy tech. These are all of the industries that are important um, as it relates to New York City um, infrastructure. So the practicality of that, it becomes important. 
Obviously, um, I don't have to tell this um, body about the importance of higher education and learning a post-secondary and what that means in terms of earnings over the course of a lifetime as compared to individuals that have a degree, does not have a degree, as well as individuals who dropped out. We touched on various points in that, um, but one of the things that we um, that was talked about here as it relates to the ECI um, graduation rates. We connect those graduation rates to the CTE graduation rates, which is 82%. So when we think about the schools with 86%, it only makes sense that CTE schools, if you have a pathway approach and students are engaged within their education, they understand what they're going to get as it relates to their academics, their industry credential, and a, and a pathway. Um, for them, it's only going to make sense that they're going to also graduate at a higher rate, which means that in the CTE schools, um, that higher rate is 82%. So we think about that, but the four aspects of the um, model that we like one again, extended time, excuse me, extended time where students get a six year and um, six year um, stay in, in, in high school, so that extended time. I talked about the industry credential that's related to their field, it's an enhancement and it shows that the students have mastery. So if they're in IT and they get a Cisco certification, it's important. If they're in, in automotive and they get a, a, an ASC certification, six of eight, that means that they have mastery. These are the things that are the quantifying. Um, the academic credentials, besides the diploma, the associate's degree, as well as an enhanced diploma, which brings to that. And last but not least, which was not talked about, which is important hand in hand to education, is the work-based learning experiences and the experiences that they received um, going through a school, especially with a CTE pathway. As part of a component, it's important that the students not only have a related field, gain credentials, but also are working in a field related to their interest. Uh, so th we believe that that's a very important thing that we need. And what the, the model, the PTEC model does uh, for um, all of our schools is that it connects, um, it creates the whole ecosystem, industry, higher education. It has the Department of Education. It engages us in the unions, it engages others as well as government. We look at labor market trends. We look at the infrastructure in New York and what those trends look like, and we match that to um, what it is that we know that these uh, models are designed to do. So um, obviously, let me um, speed it up by talking about, we talked about the college now and a number of students that's impacted by the college now. We need to support those programs. We need to support those programs that's going to allow with the 20,000 plus students that are involved in that when the number of schools, it should be all high schools, although they use the number 200, uh, 390 high schools, there's 480 some odd high schools. So there's a lot of high schools that's not in that portfolio or using college now. We need to be able to support programs that do that where students can actually uh, do that. The UFT, by and large, we um, been working with CUNY for many years in terms of that, as well as with the Department of Education, uh, specifically in the CTE space. We've worked with um, CUNY with their um, Office of Collaborative um, Programs. I know um, through my office we've done something with the Carpet D program, the teacher leaders quality, because although we talk about the student preparation, it's also about um, the teacher preparation that goes hand in hand. Um, we talked about um, BARD where it talks about the credentials of the teachers, but we also want to make sure that when we talk about pathways and opportunities for students that that um, diversity and that opportunity um, holds true for um, many of our students as well as the teachers getting the various types of professional learnings that they need to enhance their skills. So we support that. Obviously, we support education, not just because we're a union. We also put our money where our mouth is with our, um, our, our Albert, Albert Shanker Scholarship Fund, where we give millions of dollars away for students that are going to four-year institutions, that are going to continue their learning, and we do that as part of a, a graduate program as well. So the idea in, in terms of this conversation about students gaining the credential, um, I know we talked about a lot of the, um, the important topics about the statistical data and those things, but from a practical um, standpoint, I submit my t testimony, obviously, in terms of why this is important, why we support it, and why we have to collaboratively work together to provide students and, um, with the opportunities that they need to be successful um, in their career path. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, please.
Uh, good morning. Okay, so good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. It is really a great pleasure and honor for me to be here today. Um, today I speak to you on behalf of the stakeholders of Medgar Evers College Preparatory School, our students, parents, faculty, staff, and community of Medgar Evers College Preparatory School. Medgar Evers College Preparatory School is a 6 through 12 school located on the campus of Medgar Evers College. Despite the fact that over 65% of the students at Medgar Evers College Preparatory School are economically disadvantaged and qualify for the federal free lunch, we have high attendance, retention, and graduation rate. Our students are diverse, enthusiastic, and engaged. Many are from immigrant families. MECPS has a population of approximately 1,260 students. We only have 56 teachers. Compare that to some schools that have 48 teachers to 600 students. Um, over 70% of Medgar Evers College Preparatory School students belong to communities of low socioeconomic status who have historically not have access or success in higher education. Approximately 90% of our students are African American descent, a group historically underrepresented in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I want to add to that, that this year, for example, we had 196 of our students pass one or more AP exams. And College Board um, acknowledged 61 students, or they designated 61 students as AP scholars, AP scholars with honors, and AP scholar with distinction. Over the past 16 years, through the leadership team and the commitment of the school's dedicated staff of educators, MECPS has produced graduation and attendance rates that exceed 95% over the past 12 years. Our students matriculate into most of the top colleges and universities in the country and excel in their chosen major. Our mission is to provide all of our students with a superior college preparatory education. The specialized academic program at MECPS is based on the philosophy that all students are entitled to and can succeed in college preparatory programs when the curriculum is rigorous and engaging, when the school emphasizes good character, community responsibility, realization of potential, and when a community network supports students' academic, social, and physical well-being in a holistic approach. The following are noteworthy. At the NCAA Centennial Convention in July 2009, the then President, President Obama, cited Medgar Evers College Preparatory School as having an innovative approach that challenges students to complete high school while simultaneously earning an associate degree or college credit. In 2010, the school received the coveted inspirational award bestowed annually by a college board to only three schools nationally that have demonstrated exemplary college preparation and also advanced placement um, courses. As I stated before, we have over 200, close to 200 students who passed one or more AP exam last year. We also, Megervis College Preparatory School has now become an AP capstone school where students have the opportunity of earning, in addition to the various high school diploma offered by New York State, they can also earn an AP capstone diploma. Medgar College Preparatory School has been able to realize its mission despite the fact that the school is in dire need of 
basic resources. We have no gym, we have no auditorium, we have inadequate classroom. We have a situation, for example, this year, where our AP Physics 1 class has 39 students. Our AP, uh, several of our AP classes has over 34, classes, 34 students. All of our region's chemistry and physics class, they all have over 34 students. That is the sort of condition that we operate in. But despite that, the, the school continues to do well because we have a philosophy that when there is no way, we find a way to succeed. The structure of Medgar Evers College Preparatory School is very important. Our school consists of three basic strands. Grade six, seven and eight, that is our early high school. Grades nine and 10, that is our high school. And grades 11 and 12, our early college. What is so unique about these strands? In sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, our early high school, note I did not say middle school because we do not have a middle school. We have an early high school. In this early high school model, students begin with six weeks of rigorous summer school and also a Saturday academy. Then in the seventh grade, they take four regents examinations, the Algebra I, the Geometry, the Living Environment, and the Global History. In the eighth grade, they take the Physics, some take the Chemistry, the English, the U.S. History, and some of our students take the Mandarin and Chinese regions. Let me just share with you our results this year. Of the 58 students who took the physics regions, 54 of those students pass. And I'm not talking about passing with 65. They all scores in the 80s and the 90s. 17 out of 20 students pass the chemistry regions, and 64 students pass the algebra two trig regions, which most high school students do not take. By the time these students get to the ninth grade, they begin to take advanced placement courses in the ninth grade or high school. And those students who join us for the first time from other schools in the ninth grade, they also are put on an accelerated track. So by the end of the 10th grade, they will complete all of their regents exam and are ready for our early, high, early college program in the, 10, in the 11th and the 12th grade. By the end of the the, the 10th grade, most students in our school have completed all of their regents exams, and in addition to that, they have taken several AP courses. Thus, they are ready for our early college program in the 11th and 12th grade. A little bit of history about our early college program. In 2002, we started um, the, the dual enrollment program through Medgar Evers College, our partner school, with just about absolutely no support from the DOE. This partnership continued until about 2009. And in 2009, we, um, the program was kind of went on a lull because of the lack of financing. And then we applied for the state early college grant in 2010. The grant was awarded in 2011, and we established the early college program. The early college program, the award, the grant was for $450,000 over three years. We had to admit only 75 students in the first year. So can you imagine 75 students for, um, with $150,000 where we have to provide books and all of those um, kind of things. But our first group, this first cohort in um, 2013, we had 35 of these students receive their associate degree, and the other students completed at least one year of, um, of, of college. Over the next two years, when the grant was renewed, the amount of the grant, with the increase in college expenses and so forth, we had to reduce the number of students in the program from 75 to 50. Thus, we saw a drop in the number of students who graduated from the program. But despite that, we still try to work 
our way as best as possible to ensure as many students gain access to this program. Now, the question that we face is that with the limited um, funding, we have to reduce or only made only 75, now less than 50 students have access to this program in the 11th and the 12th grade. And so for a graduating class, the number of students in the 11th and 12th grade are over 500 students. So in each grade, we have to select 40, um, between 40 and 50 students for this program. I mean, I can tell you that this is a very, very difficult thing to do because most of our students are qualified for this program and they're enthusiastic, they want to work hard, but because of the limited funding that we have, we have to restrict the number of students who are in this program. So, so over the years, the program started out being successful. Now we are seeing that the only way that we will be able to continue to have the level of success that we have had in this program in the past is through um, sustainable funding. Unlike the early college initiative with um, the, the DOE, our students do not enjoy, our school do not enjoy that kind of status. So the the survival of the program depend on whether or not the state renew this grant and we become qualified or we are selected for this grant um, each year. Um, the, this program has been instrumental in a number of ways to our school. Um, we know for a fact that our students, when they go on to college, they end up spending three years. In, in fact, some students who have continued in CUNY have graduated in two years. Um, in this year at um, Nazareth College, or a partner school, we're having 11 students who are graduating in three years. Many of these students are also graduating with double degree. So this program is instrumental in terms of increasing the number of high school graduates, college graduates, in reducing costs, um, in just, and most of the students who are in this program they are the first time graduates. And in, even in some cases, they are the first one in their family graduating from high school. So while the program works and work very, very well, unlike most other schools, we are in this unique situation. And perhaps there may be other schools such as us, I don't know, where we, the, the survival of our program depends solely on whether or not the state will renew this grant at the end of the, at the, end of the year. Um, just a, a few other points. The, 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 the model that we have put in place, the early high school model, it lays that foundation from the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade that prepares these students to be highly successful, not just in college, but not just in high school, but college and beyond. And this is the perfect model where students complete all high school courses, all high school regions take um, AP examination by the end of the 10th grade, ready for this um, program. But again, because of funding, we are not able to do so. So I would appeal to the council, to the DOE, to do whatever is possible to ensure the survival of this program because we are serving a community that really lacked these opportunities. And I may also point out, and this is really critical, the associate degree that our students receive, this degree is in science, biological science, or computer science. So because our focus is really in the STEM area where our student is, where students of color or representation are somewhat lacking. Thank you. Thank you, next please. Hi, good, good. I think I'm the first one to say good afternoon. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, as I was preparing my testimony, um, I was wondering how I would make the case for how Monroe College fits into this whole concept of dual enrollment. And now that I've been able to sit through a variety of presentations, I think I have um, just the answer about how we fit in. So my name is Karen Ann Cardi. I'm the Vice President of Academic Affairs at Monroe College. I've had a 35-year career in education. My husband is a proud UFT uh, member, uh, working uh, teaching in the Bronx. 
And for 16 of my years, I've been working at Monroe College. And Monroe, for those of you who don't know, has been an anchor for 80, over 80 years in the Bronx, offering career-oriented education, and for 50 years now um, uh, in New Rochelle, uh, actually for 35 of those years in New Rochelle, uh, feels like 50 to me. Um, and uh, we have been having a tremendous impact on our communities on both of our campuses. Uh, for today, though, I, I will focus on the Bronx because that's where, uh, you know, we're focused uh, in this area today. There is something very important about Monroe that I think people should know, and so we are a private college that has been family-led for all of our 80-plus year history. And so we've had three generations leading the college, keeping us focused on our mission and keeping us focused on our communities. And um, in the Bronx, um, we've had a tremendous impact. Um, and we've been branching out from mostly adult education in the Bronx, adult commuting education, to having a greater and greater impact in our high schools. So recently, Mark Jerome became the president of Monroe College, and he has made it his signature event, uh, his signature issue, to actually expand into the high schools, speak with the principals, and find out how we can be of service. So just a few um, points about Monroe. Uh, we offer in the same institution associate, bachelor's, and master's degree programs. We have some of the best outcomes in the country for low-income and minority students. In fact, the latest data that came out from IPED show that we graduated the highest number of African American and Latino students in New York State in 2015. Um, we have uh, one of the highest graduation rates and lowest student, default, uh, student loan default rates uh, in the country for students we serve. And now that we have a, a, a new president who is focused on um, access and affordability, we have been penetrating high schools and finding out from principals what they need. Um, he personally has visited over 100 high schools, and I have been following up with him going into the high schools, speaking with the principals and the guidance counselors about what we can do. For over 15 years, Monroe has been providing um, early college access. Um, and our purpose in doing this, we've reached about 10,000 students over the course of that time, is first, uh, as many of us have said, to introduce students to the college search process and uh, the college selection process, to provide them with an enriched academic and career-focused fo experience, and to make college more affordable because all of our early access programs, like the others who have said, uh, men, uh, given testimony today, we actually provide our programs free of charge. We do not charge students for books. We do not charge students fees. Um, we provide everything to them, and they can walk away with a transcript that they can take to the college of their choice. Um, our programs have evolved over the past 15 years, starting with our largest program, which is called Jumpstart at Monroe, and that's where we offer uh, college courses to high school students on our campuses on Saturday mornings, um, and we have reached hundreds of students each year um, through our Jumpstart program. After we had a, a history of that program, many principals and guidance counselors would ask us if we could come to their school and offer the courses at their schools because of the transportation and other logistics related to it. And so we've had selected um, high schools over the past several years where we have gone into the high schools with a college professor to offer college courses on the high schools. And generally, these are courses in one of our career-related degree programs, business, accounting, information technology, um, medical, uh, you know, allied health professions, et cetera. Um, and then, most recently, and this is why I have to tell you that I was delighted to be here today, to really hear what everyone had to say, because most recently, we launched um, a true dual enrollment program with several high schools, three high schools to be exact, where they have asked us to actually provide more of a, of a pathway, an expansion of these free college courses um, on their high school campuses. And we've worked very closely with these principals to try to craft a pathway. So hearing all of these models that people have been discussing today is actually very eye-opening for me and very helpful. Um, what, what we did with when the principals had asked us to expand this dual enrollment, we were happy to do it, but we also knew that we were going to have to expand the ranks of our faculty be, 
you know, to be deployed out to the high schools. And so we did also develop what we call the high school faculty development program, where we have taken on high school faculty who are qualified to teach at the college level, who essentially become adjunct faculty at Monroe. They have access to all of the training and faculty development that we do. They are partnered with a mentor, and they're actually teaching the Monroe courses on the high school um, campuses. We've done that just with three high schools this year, and it's brand new, so I can't really give you data on it. We're actually in the process now of visiting the high schools and, the, and seeing um, how things are going with the principals. Um, what I, I, I gave a lot of thought to this issue of the earning of the associate degree in the high school, and now that I've learned so much more about what's happening at uh, CUNY and at Bard and at Medgar Evers, you know, I see the value. But what I learned as a novice, and I just want to share this with you because I think it will be relevant, is that there are certainly, certainly financial benefits to the earning of a, an associate degree credential in high school. Um, but if we want to expand a model out to places like Monroe, where we would have individual institutions actually partnering with individual high schools and forming that kind of partnership, I think that the, the, um, there are a number of logistical issues that are really um, prevalent. And also, we have to think about the value that we're actually adding for the students. So what I've learned in working with the individual high schools and trying to craft this pathway, because we don't have a full system or a full, you know, integrated right into the high school, is the logistics are really, um, are, are really can really be an impediment. We have to m mesh the high school uh, curriculum and uh, schedule and flow with what we do with the college. We have to ensure that the faculty we deploy you know, understand the Monroe culture and can also be integrated into the high school culture. We have to plan the scheduling and the traveling and all of that. So there are those logistical issues. But they are really surmountable as long as we know that in the end we're doing something that's tremendously worthwhile. The downside, I think, to a full associate degree in a model like we would have at Monroe is Monroe offers, we run all year round, so we offer um, three full academic semesters every year, and students who come to us can actually earn a baccalaureate degree in less than three years if they go straight through. So if we have the model where we have a student essentially finishing their associate degree at the age of 17 or 18, and they come to Monroe, they will be completed with a baccalaureate degree at perhaps the age of 19. And because we are career focused, we not only want to make sure the student has the appropriate academic credential, but that they actually have the professional maturity and that they would actually be employable um, to the types of employers that we serve through our educational programs. So that was uh, a thought that I gave that, that made me give pause and say, you know what, we really have to investigate this and make sure we feel really good about it um, before we dive in. Um, there is, uh, you know, one principal who did ask us to map out a pathway for a cohort of students who, similarly to what others have mentioned, by 10th grade, they had completed regions, they had many of their high school uh, credentials under their belt, and that was a, a discrete cohort of students, and we actually have crafted out a 30 credit program for them um, that we're just implementing now, and so the results of that remain to be seen. Um, she was the most ambitious principal that we had, and um, it is though the, the, it is rigorous and it is year round, and the students have to be completely committed, as well as the parents and the college and the high school. Um, I think that to to bring my my comments to a close, the value that we've had as an institution in engaging in this kind of dialogue with our principals has been invaluable. We've been working together to try to improve our outcomes at the high school and our outcomes at the college. And I think that the kinds of conversations we're having um, really you know, will, tr will point us in the right direction going forward as to how far to go, how much exposure is, works perfectly well, and how much might be too much down the line. So those are the questions that we're exploring at Monroe. And um, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. I want to thank 
the panel for their presentation and just a few questions for um, Ms. Cardi. Yes. Dr. Cardi. Mm -hmm. In part of your addendum, you have faculty development programs for high school partners, and you talk about uh, the candidate has to submit a resume, you have to be interviewed, provide a demonstration lesson, and complete faculty development programs. And then for your professional development components, uh, you say training in Monroe's course management system, Blackboard, and an opportunity to earn Blackboard certification. What is Blackboard? Is okay, a so um, at our college, we use the course management system called Blackboard, and that is a system which houses all of our courses. And we create um, within that system what we call master shells so that each faculty member will have housed electronically all of the resources they need. It allows us to do assessments uh, electronically through Blackboard. It allows us to do collaborative sessions, even um, remotely. And it's just a, a community engagement um, tool as well as a course management system. So the beauty of that for the high schools is that because all of our um, resources are housed there, when the faculty come and they get certified in using that software, mm -hmm. they then can okay. deliver the coursework at the high school. Okay, good. Um, Dr. Wiltshire, can you just share a little bit of your history with the DOE? <laughs> well, um, I, I, I started, um, well, I became principal at Medgar Evers College Preparatory School in um, 2001, and uh, I have been there <laughs> since then. Um, I, 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 I think that in terms of our history with the um, DOE, I would say that we had to somewhat charter our own course and we had to, you know, when we, for example, when we started out our early college, um, our early high school, when we developed the early high school model, um, it was something that was approved, supported by the DOE. Um, but then in subsequent years, they decided to revisit that model. And um, in 2013, I think that they decided that they were going to review that model to see if um, there should be some changes in our approach. Um, but that was not, but they were not successful, and so they approve us to continue with that model. And so we are now in another situation where um, there are some concerns about our admissions um, policy and whether or not that should become, well, and, the, and that should become a part of the central admission process that um, they want to bring all of the middle school under. Uh, the, the, the thing is that when we um, created, um, when we, well, when we transform middle college high school to Medgar Evers College Preparatory School, it was supposed to be a unique model that did not focus on the traditional high school, the traditional middle school model. And so, and that is the reason why and um, we focus mainly on the um, high school level courses and so on and so forth. Okay, earlier on I asked the DOE about a document which they had released which was a draft talking about proposed changes to your admission policy and no one seemed to know what in the world I was talking about. Um, is there any representative still here from the DOE? Okay, so um, it's interesting that there was this great deniability when I asked about it, or no one knew the ignorance. So, have they pulled back? Well, uh, that is possible because I, I've never seen that draft, really. So I, I don't know what draft you're speaking um, to, um, because well, you know, I got, I saw a draft, but not from the DOE. So what I'm saying, I've not seen any official draft from the DOE as to what the new policy is going to be. 
Okay, have they involved you at all? Have they um, reached yes, out we to did you? meet with the senior deputy chancellor. Um, she visited our school. She met with a group of parents, SLT, PTA, including myself, and she did outline the chancellor's vision um, as to what as to what the new approach to um, their admission policy will be for middle schools, for all middle schools, including our school. The thing with Medgar, we are a citywide school, and the admission has always been local. Um, so that admission process. Um, and how many students are enrolled at Mega Evers? College 1,260 students. 1,260. 60. And how many staff members do you have? Uh, we have 56 staff members. And what's the average class size? Uh, um, it varies. Um, uh, the, I would say the average class size um, contractually um, for grades. Um, it's, I would say that our average class size is over 30, is about 34, it's close about to 34. 34 yeah. I mean, you know, you're going to find that there are some classes with much less students, right. um, but yeah. And, and so you said that your funding is from the state? Yes. Through the early college, high school, Grand. their scholars program? Yes. And so if the state were to not give you funding, how would that impact your program? The program would end. So what does the DOE do for you to maintain this program? Nothing. No, we do not get any support from the DOE. The only support that we get from this program is for a partner school, um, Medgar Evers College, who over the years have come up with all sorts of creative ways to give our students an opportunity to take um, college um, classes through the dual enrollment program. But that is with no No, no other funding from. comes through that? No. Okay. Um, so, my final question. Were you ever an ECI school? Do you want to become an ECI well, school? Would well, it be advantageous to you to do that? So, when the RFB came out for the establishment of the first ECI school, we did apply, but our application was not successful. So would you be interested in being an ECI school, or do you not see an advantage to that? Um, well, that is something that I definitely like to explore. If it's a situation where um, we can do some of the things that I've heard here today, um, certainly. It okay. Seems, yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Barron and um, <coughs> Mr. Robeson. Uh, in terms of... Um, uh, the ECI schools within the Department of Education. Are any of those schools pros schools? That's actually a good question. I am not 100% sure. They may, they may be, uh, but I'm not 100% sure, so I don't want to give you an answer. The reason I'm asking, I'm just wondering if there are any special provisions that need to be made or are made in regard to uh, the um, ECI schools any contractual concerns in those schools beyond the obvious? I mean, the construct of the school gives it um, what it is. They still are following the um, <clears throat> collective bargaining agreements in those areas, um, the flexibility of pros, and um, that's the progressive redesign opportunity schools of excellence that we have within our contract that allows more flexibility in terms of loosening up um, some of the rules that may um, schools may find cumbersome, but that's something that the that uh, the school community has to agree upon in terms of making those kinds of uh, changes. So I think I heard in your testimony that the uh, most positive impact on students, um, whether they be in ECI schools or if they're in CTE programs, is the. Um, the end goal is established for them, that they know what it is that they're aiming for. Can you elaborate a little bit further on that for me? Absolutely. So um, uh, when you think about uh, students that may have an interest in um, health careers, and we have a hero high, uh, health education, um, research opportunity schools that's connected to, um, to 
to host those community college in the Bronx, but at the same time, you know, you have in the Bronx, you have Montefiore Hospital, which is big. You have St. Barnabas. You have Lincoln. You have a variety of folks in, you, in, in terms of that um, ecosystem of higher education, as well as um, what are the trends that's happening in that community around healthcare. So that school is geographically located in an area that um, you know that's going to be important as it relates to the viability of the community. The same thing holds true um, if you look at the historic way back when days of vocational education when you have a school like aviation. It's not by happenstance that in, it's in Queens. It's not by happenstance that they're connected to Vaughn College. It's not by happenstance that they're connected to um, JFK and LaGuardia Airport geographically. So the, the, the original concept of these schools and pathways, it's almost like going back to the future, right? But what we're doing is um, looking at the current models and the current um, demands of industry, as well as looking at the infrastructure of New York and where the trends are, obviously the Bronx, in terms of medical, hospitality, tourism, and we can go on and on for the variety of boroughs, for all of the boroughs, and then we can think about those models. So when a student is going to that particular school, they know what it is that they want to do. Now, it does not necessarily mean, although they may have that interest, they are young people, and they tend to change their mind. But the idea of them getting their foundational skills academically, getting a credential that's offered to them as an enhancement that shows mastery, having a um, post-secondary partner, it gives them um, the, the, the grit and the determination and all of the things necessary for them to be successful uh, as lifelong learners and as well as being able to fit in our global um, knowledge economy and be successful. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that assessment, and I think at this point I'm going to leave it at that on a good positive note, and uh, thank you all for coming in, and we will call our next panel up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our panel of students who have waited all this time to come and give some testimony is made up of Ruben Contreras from the Renaissance Charter School in Jackson Heights, Mustafa Jalel, also from the Renaissance Charter School. Uh, Jared Almines, Renaissance Charter School, and Abrar Kazi from the Renaissance Charter School as well. Come up, have a seat, and welcome to the Renaissance Charter School, to the New York City Council's Committee on Education Hearing. Oftentimes I say, gentlemen, that we wish we could hear your testimony first because it's uh, very, very important to us. Unfortunately, part of our job, or fortunately, depending on how you're looking at it, is to grill uh, the administration and the agencies that are involved about what they're offering our students so we don't get to you students um, as, as quickly as we would like, but we certainly definitely value your contributions. So I need to sway you in. So would you raise your right hand, and uh, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Okay, who would like to start? All right, very good. Make sure that red light is on, and speak loud and clear. Um, good afternoon. My name is Mustafa Jalal. I came from Bangladesh and I'm 13 and I've resided in New York City for 12 years and I went to a New York City school for nine years. I believe high schoolers should have the capability of earning college credits. Since college prices are increasing every day, month, and year, they're in the thousands. Many families and students are going into enormous debts. With the capability of high schoolers able to earn college credits would really lower a, fam a family or student's financial burden. There are many students who take the, their studies very seriously, and some of the time they are not in a financial po position to afford further education for the successful future that they deserve. And actually, I know a family friend who graduated from Bard High School 
uh, early college. And the family told us that the two-year early college the provided by Bard really financially helped them since th uh, the student already started to study on her subject. Conclusively, I think that the college credits will really benefit many families, not only positively and financially. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next, please. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Abrad Kazi and... Um, Pull the mic down a little bit like this. There you go, and a little closer. You pull the whole bottom, the base. There you go. And um, I was born in New York and I was going to school for eight years. And I'm, uh, I'm, in, I'm 12 years old and I'm currently in seventh grade in the school, uh, the Renaissance Charter School. And... <clears throat> I agree that um, the uh, high school students should get college credits because um, it's a better opportunity for them and uh, it'll help them uh, get a get a scholarship and a degree and it's gonna help them financially because they necessarily wouldn't have to pay a lot of money and uh, they wouldn't like uh, lose a lot of money and this will help them uh, in a way financially in a positive way. Uh, thank you. Have a good time. Okay, thank you. Next, please. All right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ruben Contreras, and I'm currently in the 10th grade at Renaissance Charter School. Um, I'm taking two AP classes and handle my studies very seriously as I want to get as many credits from high school as possible. You see, I come from a blue collar family, right? So. I don't have the same financial capabilities as others for my advanced education, and therefore I want and need to take full advantage of all of the opportunities that high school offers me. Um, I believe that students should be allowed to receive as many college credits as possible because I know there's a lot more like me that they, they don't have the same opportunities to receive like your scholarships and others per se, because like me, I have to watch my younger siblings every day after school because my mother always works uh, like around 15 hours and same as my parents. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. And the next, please. Uh, okay, hi. Um, good afternoon, my name is Jared Albinez and as everyone else, I go to the Renaissance Charter School and I'm an 11th grader. And from my view, I believe that it would be agreeable for a high school student to have an to be able to have an associate's before going to college because as an eleventh grader, like I'm getting ready to prepare for college and and if I had that opportunity if yeah, if I had that opportunity to to take to take AP courses to me, I see that as an opportunity for me to not prove others wrong, but to prove me wrong, that I can do like things that college kids do at a younger age, and it just gives me the opportunity to go to college and do what I need to do for the next couple of years. Yeah, thank you, sorry. I wanna thank the panel very much for coming and for sharing your testimony with us. At the school that you attend, do you have the opportunity to take any AP classes? You do. Which areas are they in? So in beginning in the eighth grade, I believe, well, you, you already start with an advanced class in science because Unlike uh, other schools uh, at the Renaissance Charter School, you, be, you take earth science in eighth grade, and that just gives you more opportunities in that you're guaranteed by the time you're in 11th grade already taking one of the senior courses, or you can already get uh, into biology AP. Um, after that, it'd have to be in ninth grade, you can take Spanish in, no, 10th grade, my bad. and. Um, from there on, there you can take um, Spanish advanced placement classes until your senior year, and there's an English course in 11th grade. 
-hmm. Yeah, eleventh grade. Uh, there's an advanced placement in English, and also in eleventh grade there's calculus, I believe, and there's world history in tenth grade, and governments, I believe, in eleventh or no. AP U.S. history. Oh, AP U.S. history in eleventh. So that's great. Your school does have uh, quite an offering of AP classes, and so we're glad that you know about it and that you're taking those classes and availing yourself. Very good. I'd just like to say the Renaissance Charter School is one of the best schools in my district. They uh, really do prepare students well. I think the secret to their success, and I think that you'll understand what I mean, Chair Barron, when I tell you, is collaboration. Mm -hmm. They all work together, from the principal in the school, Stacy, to the teachers and the students and the parents. Very important, because the parents are very much involved in the education at this school. Um, I have just wanted to ask, because Renaissance has its own high school, um, do you have a early college program? Can you get credits at Renaissance? Uh, yes. But they also, uh, they offer college now, where you go to colleges and take college classes with like other college students. And, and the PSAT, here, you tell, tell. In order to get into the college now program, you need to have a certain uh, score on your PSAT. And that's how you get um, qualified into each of the classes. I think you mentioned in your testimony about this being an encouragement for you to want to achieve a goal. Can you explain that a little bit further? Well, my family doesn't have, uh, like, like I said, it doesn't have the financial stability to guarantee me at not even two years, maybe three, in, uh, in college. And therefore, I have to take full advantage of, of what I can get right now because my future in advanced education is unsure. So make the best out of what you have. And do you have college ca uh, counselors uh, at Renaissance? I wouldn't be aware because I just joined last year. I'm pretty sure that they do have it, but um, yes? Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure if they have college counselors or not. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, uh, a lot of questions uh, ro were, were raised today about the differences between high school and colleges. And I have to tell you, the one big difference that I found was that you have a lot more freedom when you go to college. Uh, you're not there all day long. You might go one day for one period, and then the next day you go for three periods. And it's really learning to have that discipline to be sure that you show up for classes and do the right thing in order to be able to get the degree. But even down to that you know, level, those are the things that students need to know, I think, to prepare them for college. So we hope that uh, that is what's happening at the Renaissance. I'm pretty sure that that probably is. And uh, we thank you. I'm going to have a little session with you after this hearing is over. So stay, don't move. And I think some of your other students are up here as well. They're going to join us in a moment. And I want to thank you all for coming in today and for giving testimony and for waiting so long to be able to give that testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Seeing no further uh, witnesses to give testimony, we are adjourned.